Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Here we are in the course on fundamental bicycle principles within the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning as always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord, send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. Questions or comments from previous lectures or anything in the program? Or any news you've seen lately about uh, bioethics? I say not a week goes by without a bioethical issue arising <laughs> on the horizon. Okay. Uh, so, for example, just this morning, uh, I've mentioned that uh, usually <clears throat> early in the morning, I look at the headlines on the BBC just on my phone. And then if I find an article of interest, I go in to read the actual article or send it to my email for later <laughs> review. Uh, and for the past several days, it's been in the international news. Again, a rehash of the origin of the uh, COVID uh, virus. Mm -hmm. Three years out from the pandemic, it's still controversial. Uh, if it was produced in the lab, the Wuhan lab, Institute for Virology, which is about 20 miles away from the market, which is still considered the market, the Wuhan market, the um, it's a called wet market where they sell all kinds of animals and plants and wildlife for food. Anyway, and the market itself is still considered ground zero where the infection started in humans, right? But it's so controversial that it jumped from an animal or known as a vector or intermediate host into the human population, like HIV did, for example decades earlier in Africa, or was it actually manufactured in the lab and escaped? Uh, there's a lot of evidence, even internal from the Wuhan Institute of Virology website online, which you can read either in Chinese or in English, <laughs> that uh, they are engineering viruses. They themselves admit it on the website, you know, and they take pride in it actually. That's going to be a lecture in the healthcare bioethics uh, course on the, the bioethics of pandemics. So there's no doubt that, the, that there was genetic engineering being done in all kinds of microorganisms, but especially viruses in that institute, in that lab. Uh, the question is, uh, <laughs> the million dollar question or billion dollar question, trillion dollar question is, did it come, um, did it escape? In other words, that's a P4 lab. That's supposed to be the highest containment of lab. Nothing is supposed to get in or out of a level four lab, right? Scientific lab. <clears throat> so anyway, we'll cover that. Uh, I'm covering that in the healthcare uh, course in a few weeks with the other cohort, the, the cohort who is graduating now in May. So not a week goes by without a bioethical issue coming up again. So I encourage you to look at those and uh, first read the headlines at least, be informed of what's going on in the rest of the world. And I look at the BBC because I have a lot of difficulty finding international news in American news media, right? Whether it's TV or radio or internet. And so I look at the BBC, the British Broadcast Corporation, uh, <clears throat> their international news. Uh, anyway, so going forward, and if ever you come across these bioethical issues, bring them up and uh, we'll either discuss them or I'll refer you to when we'll discuss them in luxury of detail uh, in our coming lectures. Okay. All right, so we're continuing on this process in this course, uh, the fundamental principles in uh, Catholic bioethics. And again, I always like to recap the big picture and then zero into the detail. Uh, I've mentioned before that 
today, essentially, there are two ways of doing bioethics. Uh, one is from the principal perspective. The other one is from the utilitarian perspective. And at the end of the day, in my analysis over years of dealing with these uh, topics, is that it comes down to how to justify or if we're going to justify ethically the means or not, the means toward an end. Right? Because we're talking about human behavior, and human behavior many times is uh, end or goal oriented. We do things for a certain purpose, reason, and the goals may be good ethical reasons, right? The end itself, for example, a lot of topics in healthcare, as you can imagine, healing someone. But the means, right, the means in principle of bioethics also have to be justified ethically. Uh, how, the how we do that healing should be justified. Mm -hmm. Whereas in utilitarian bioethics, essentially uh, that camp basically sticks to what is known as legalism. In other words, as long as it's legal, go ahead and do it. Uh, don't worry about the ethics of the means themselves, because it's legal. And then they say to us, who we'll take exception to that reasoning, is, well, not everything that is legal is ethical. And they say, well, if you think it's so bad, then change the law. <laughs> make it make it illegal, right? But as long as it's legal, it's ethical in, in their, in their uh, estimation. So they'll say, don't break the law. But if the law allows it, what's the problem? Well, I always use one example, which at some point we have to appeal to basic intuitions about human nature, right? You have to get down to kind of the core of why yes or why not. And for example, adultery, I think that most rational people, that's another thing too, I use the norm, not the exception. Uh, so I say most rational people, because we know that some people are irrational in our society. Uh, either temporarily or permanently, right? Uh, but that's, uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know if it's a skewed distribution. My intuition is a normalized distribution. We talked about uh, a little bit of statistics and a normal distribution, right? Most people in, in society are, are normal for their age group. And we know that uh, developing the brain and the mind takes uh, several years, decades actually, about two decades. But at some point we hit adulthood, the twenties usually, and then we move forward for the rest of our lives, hopefully thinking rationally, right? You know, I would say that for no, most normal people, uh, adultery is unethical. You know, to cheat on your spouse or even on your uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, to cheat on them uh, is not a good thing to do. It's, it's unethical. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, it's not really illegal, right? When was the last time you saw someone getting arrested for adultery? It's actually happening right now, uh, sadly, all over the place, and I was getting arrested for it, right? Uh, that's because the law is really minimalist. The law is minimal because if we were to design a law, in fact, actually in, uh, in a number of states, uh, adultery is still in the law books, but it's not enforced. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but it could, because it's just more expensive to go through the legal process of getting it out of the, the law books, right? Or, uh, but it's not really enforced because what are we going to do? We're going to put cameras in uh, people's bedrooms and are we going to ask for marriage licenses whenever this couple is intimate and so forth? It's impossible. You can't really enforce it unless one becomes too intrusive into society. Hmm? And it would be a totalitarian regime. Uh, for example, another news I saw this week uh, from uh, one of the African countries made it illegal uh, to be a homosexual, right? Well, that's an extreme position because how do you enforce that? Hmm? One thing is the behavior and another thing is the actual orientation of the person. So. That's an extreme thing, and I'd be interested to see how they're going to enforce that because that's going toward a totalitarian regime hmm? that can lead to uh, persecution, prejudice, etc. And then, of course, the pendulum swings the other way. 
And then we get uh, uh, demonstrations in society that can actually become violent because it's too much government intrusion, right? But uh, so that's an example there, going back to the original example of adultery, I think normal people uh, agree that adultery is uh, unethical, should not be done, and yet no one's getting arrested for it. So it's legal, right? But it's unethical. So there is an example where we can see very clearly that uh, the law, the civil positive law, is not able to cover all the aspects of ethics. And so we have to appeal to a deeper uh, source of behavior, which is really our conscience, our conscience. And uh, it's uh, again, interesting how our culture, what we call Western culture, right? Again, in the broad stroke and the big picture, it comes from classical Greece about 500 years before the time of Christ where we had these, uh, there was enough peace in Athens, in the city of Athens to be able to think and reflect and deeply and widely. And so many of the endeavors of society to this day come from classical Greece. For example, not only philosophy, but also the sciences, uh, mathematics, the arts, aesthetics, uh, music, theater, you name it. It all came out from classical Greece there about 500 years before the time of Christ. And at that time in Athens and expanding through what was known as Magna Grecia, uh, in other words, the bigger uh, Greek uh, empire, uh, Greek uh, civilization, mm, the ideal human was the virtuous person, the virtuous person there virtuous uh, person, man or woman, okay? So virtue. And there were secular virtues because like their theology, their religion was polytheistic, was very confused, was a wild imagination of gods and goddesses who interacted with the humans. And in fact, even the human, the, the, the gods had sex with women, with human women. And the, the product of that was the heroes like Hercules and Ulysses and all these who had a human figure, but they had superhuman powers, right? To this day, by the way, that tradition also continues in, um, well, what we call the heroes of uh, entertainment and the comic books like Superman and, and Robin Hood and all that, not Robin Hood, uh, Batman. They can do, they can fly and so forth, you know? Uh, for some reason, flying seems to be the biggest one for humans, the biggest fantasy to defy gravity and they have superhuman powers, but they look like human beings. Anyway, we have inherited a lot from classical Greece and essentially it's the core of uh, our Western culture. Eastern is different, it's, it's more mystical and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> what I wanna say by that is that the virtues, the, the exercise, the pursuit of virtue, it's even into the constitution, that pursuit of happiness, Truly for Aristotle and these people, uh, the virtuous person was a happy person. Okay? And Christianity picked up on that, including beginning with Jesus Christ himself. And you, if you read the, uh, the gospels, if you read the teachings of Christ, it's all about living a virtuous life really. Mm -hmm. And uh, what involves to be a virtuous person, including sacrifice and generosity, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and the pursuit of truth and wisdom. So we obtained a lot from classical Greece going forward now, two thousand five hundred years later. I think that it's an argument that it could be used a lot in society today, especially trying to engage a secular society that doesn't necessarily believe in God or uh, any particular established religion of Christianity or Islam or. Judaism, uh, people, many people in our society, they're just secular humanists. Uh, they're disenchanted about the institutions, the, the, the traditional religious institutions. And so they're just going it their way. I think that the argument of virtue, right, is can be promoted from a humanistic perspective to excel. Even why is it that people study? You know, why are you students? 
um, putting so much effort into studying, you could be doing something else. You, this morning, you could be either be sleeping or at the beach or, or just hanging out with your friends, having a leisure breakfast, etc. And instead, on a Saturday morning, <laughs> here you are in class, here we are, right? Uh, why did I pursue two doctorates? Uh, one when I was, the first one when I was 40 years old, the second one was when I was 50 years old, <laughs> because of the drive, the desire for knowledge and the truth and seeking the truth, which is a lifelong quest. So priorities are different. Anyway, virtue, I think, can be promoted uh, today in society to seek to live an ethical life, <laughs> a bioethical life. So I've been diverged about that. Yes, the program, we're looking at these fundamental principles mm -hmm. throughout the, this course. And uh, because we are dealing with the origin of the human species as a whole, what we call phylogenetics, right? The phylogenetics of the human species, uh, we have to, we accept, we as Catholics accept a process of evolution, as long as it continues to be open to the possibility of the existence of God a creator, uh, but we also accept and are inspired by the word of God and what we call revelation, God's manifestation to us in scripture and tradition, tradition with a capital T, which means all the magisterial documents, all the writings that have been done by uh, important people in our faith, uh, and religiously or theologically important, you know, the, uh, the patristics, uh, the theologians throughout uh, the ages, uh, also popes and bishops and people who have written what we call the magisterium, the teachings of the church, right? So incorporating all that. So far, I've been focusing mostly on the scientific evidence for evolution. And uh, soon we're going to engage now in the theological uh, complements of evolution, bringing in precisely God's word and uh, the tradition the Judeo-Christian tradition, all right? So we've looked at uh, some of the evidence for evolution, fossil record, and phylogenetics, uh, uh, percentage homology between different species, pointing to a phylogenetic tree, right? And uh, then we looked at the four main uh, drivers of evolution, uh, a mutation, migration, drift, and selection. I spent last lecture looking at selection specifically because that is ultimately what may cause evolution or not, which is about the most fit. And fitness described in a genetic sense, genetic fitness, right? Which will be manifested or not in phenotypes that are either uh, stronger phenotypes or more adapted to the environment or not to this to the selective pressure and in general that selection is a selecting out mm -hmm. uh, we have been engaged in selection we humans for millennia have been engaged in selection but we call it artificial selection because the will is engaged in other words uh going back to the origin of agricultural civilization, not the cultural civilization of the 500 years before Christ, but the agricultural origins of, um, of civilization goes back to the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, the confluence between two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia or Babylon of the time, today the area of the Middle East where Iran, Iraq, those countries are, all right? That's the agricultural, goes back about 7,000 years. Uh, uh, and that was selecting on some grass that today we call wheat, that had a little larger grain where we could get, or those people at the time could get a little more substance out of them. And it's the beginning of agriculture. Agriculture allows us to be, allows the human to be sedentary, instead of the hunter-gatherer, instead of going after wild prey out there with high risk of getting killed and so forth. And so when we start very primitive farming, then we're able to settle down in a place and we end up with a little bit of free time. And free time allows us then to think more, get creative. The synergy between the hand and the brain 
to manipulate things and to start making artifacts, pottery and so forth, where we can carry water, where we can boil uh, uh, the water to make it cleaner, where we can cook, etc. Clothing that can be made first with plant material, also with animal material, skins first to protect us from the winter. So the mortality rate goes down a little bit, etc. So you can see that the big, big benefit of agriculture in general is that we become sedentary, right? And we can stay in a particular place for a longer period of time, actually civilization, uh, generation after generation, and we continue to create more artifacts. Now you fast forward about 7,000 years to the multitude of artifacts that we have today, especially very sophisticated, like uh, uh, an actual computer in our pocket, or uh, stuff that is flying around uh, the, um, and, and this little computer in our pocket, the true microcomputer is connected to satellites that are also artifacts are about uh, 6,000 satellites that are orbiting the earth. About uh, 2,000 are active and the other 4,000 are decommissioned and just uh, space waste. <laughs> space waste, uh, eventually waiting to be either collapsing into Earth and hopefully burning in the process of the collapse so it doesn't hit anyone on the head, or flying out into space and then maybe some other civilization will find it if there is another civilization out there that is that is uh, reasonable <laughs> that I can think. And we'll see, oh, this satellite uh, going by. <laughs> Anyway, we see that we are uh, extremely sophisticated, mostly due to technology. And then that raises again the bioethical issues because technology allows us to do stuff that perhaps we should or should not do. So circle back to the functional definition of bioethics that I offered from the beginning, which is what may be done out of what can be done in science and technology today. So we can do many things like uh, human-animal hybrids in the lab, but should we do them? May we do them? That's the bioethical question. So uh, at the end of the day, with this um, artificial selection that we've been engaged in for 7,000 years, uh, we are actually copying nature by way of natural selection, only that nature, because it's mindless, in other words, there's no particular direction as such, it's just the predisposition of fitness, right? But there's a big element of chance involved, the stochastic, the stochastic uh, process that we saw in drift, for example, by chance, this animal or this plant or this organism gets to drift into uh, an area where it's uh, more adapted, et cetera, or less adapted or is taken out by some chance event. Anyway, you see that in nature, this process of selection is generally much, much slower, much slower. Mm -hmm. uh, again, recently I saw an article, no, not an article, it's gonna be a talk actually, on lizards in the Caribbean. The Caribbean, you can think is an excellent place for doing uh, research and evolution because you have a bunch of islands, Generally, islands are great incubators for evolution and they're great labs, field labs, for studying evolution because the islands are, by definition, isolated by themselves, isolated with uh, salt water. And not every uh, land creature can tolerate salt water, right? Even though some have managed, uh, not only animals like iguanas, uh, in the Galapagos that actually eat seaweed under, <laughs> under the surface mm, along the coast, because they like Galapagos actually are fairly dry. They have very little water, uh, fresh water, depend on occasional rain. And so there's a scant plant population and therefore these iguanas have adapted to going underwater in the ocean to munch on seaweed and then come out, they have to come out to breathe because they have lungs, right? They're, they're uh, uh, what you might call it, uh, reptiles. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's one adaptation. And then some plants actually have adapted to survive and to actually migrate, uh, plants migrate in salt water. Uh, the classical one, especially in the tropics and the Caribbean is the coconut, right? Coconut palm. Uh, when you throw an actual palm plant 
into the ocean, that plant is not going to survive for long embedded in salt water, right? Uh, yet we see palm trees, very close coconut palms, very close to the shore, but obviously above the shoreline, right? And uh, their nuts actually have evolved to uh, be like rafts. They can float on the ocean until they come to another coast and populate another island that originally maybe didn't have any coconut palms. So you see that uh, the Caribbean is uh, it's a very nice incubator for evolution and also field lab for studying evolution. Anyway, there's gonna be a talk at the, at the Cosmos Club. The Cosmos Club is uh, at um, in Washington DC, is one of the oldest uh, societies institute that uh, has pro been promoting uh, intellectual talks of every field in science, but also in humanities and the arts. It's kind of a philosophical society that goes back, uh, I think, at least 100 years, uh, if not more. And my brother and sister-in-law used to live in Washington, D.C. He was also a professor, he retired recently, my brother. And they were members of that Cosmos Club. So they have periodic talks, maybe once a month or so, and their, their videos, so you can see it online. You can just go Google Cosmos Club, and there's going to be a talk coming up on the lizards of the Caribbean. This uh, entomologist, right? The entomologist is the one, I think, I don't know, herpetologist. Herpetologist is the one uh, scientist who studies mm, uh, reptiles. He's going to give a talk on uh, his research on lizards in the Caribbean and the evolution of different species all related because they're all lizards, right? And in fact, it's the anole, the anole, the variety of anoles. Anoles are also known as chameleons. And <laughs> I'm looking at a chameleon here on the photo, I'm trying to zero in, don't worry, we'll get to the actual lecture soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a chameleon. And uh, this may be a young Cuban chameleon, but I'm not sure. Chameleons uh, scientifically are known as the anole, or anolis, mm, I believe that's the genus name. And there's a large variety of anoles of species throughout the world, mostly in the tropics. Well, most reptiles are, are tropic or most temperate region because they're, uh, they don't generate their own, uh, they cannot hold on to their body heat. And so they depend on the warmth of the environment for survival. Anyway, anoles, we have them here. You see that little, the, the medium-sized lizard uh, was well, certainly much smaller than an iguana that's invasive. I'm talking about uh, Miami, South Florida, right? Iguana is invasive from Central America. The, the Cuban anole, which is a large, relatively large green lizard with a yellow uh, neck, a little bar of yellow along the, the neck uh, and kind of a disproportionately large head compared to the rest of the body, kind of a triangular head. That comes from Cuba, Anolis equestris, equestris is the name. That was brought here apparently for research in the 50s at the uh, University of Miami, and then it got loose and now it's all over the place. Well, these invasive uh, lizards tend to compete and outcompete the local lizards, which tend to be generally smaller. Then there's that other lizard that we've seen around very increasing very fast in numbers. The curly tail lizard, right? They're ground lizards. They don't climb much, but uh, they do bury. They have little burrows that they make, typically under slabs of concrete or other hard surfaces. The curly tail lizard, very evident for their curly tail. And they're also quite territorial. And uh, anyway, they're displacing the local lizard population. And a lot of our local lizards uh, are anoles, anoles. Hmm? the native ones. And because climatologically, we are actually part of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. not an island, a peninsula. So, but we are uh, really the only peninsular Caribbean area, mm -hmm. a geographical region, which makes us unique because the peninsula is connected to a continent. And therefore we're not totally surrounded by salt water. We used to be way back. In fact, the peninsula has been buried several times under uh, water during the tropicalization of the earth. Uh, but uh, recently, okay, so today, 
in the past 10,000 years, more or less, Florida has been above water and uh, connected to, to a continent. So much larger variety of animals that can migrate down into the peninsula. But the anoles are a lot of our local lizard species that are native. And one is that chameleon that is a very pretty green that can also turn brown. They can change their color to brown. Then the other ones are just brown. Uh, some have a little crest on their heads and, and the, uh, the ridge on the back. Uh, those are brown. Uh, you see them around jumping from twig to twig and uh, they're quite voracious. Good for keeping the fly and the roach population down. <laughs> anyway, um, these are, so that's gonna be that talk coming up and you can see it online if you're interested, right? Uh, for example, let me just go here and do Cosmos of uh, Harry Ian and all. Let's see if it comes up. Okay, there it is. Using experiments in nature to study evolution. See the thing? I mean, it's amazing. Uh, here we are, Google sitting in Miami, Florida, and we can, there it is, connect to a talk in Washington, D.C. When is this going to be? Okay, March 31st, 8 p.m. Hmm? Jonathan Lossos is uh, the, uh, he's connected to Washington University, which is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> All right. Uh, not to be confused, University of Washington, which is in Washington State. And that's, uh, he's studying the, these are the anoles in the Caribbean. Have, they have diverged into many different species from a single genus. All right. So stay tuned for that talk. You can watch it online or you can go back into the archives later and watch it anytime after March 31st <laughs> uh, online as it's um, archived. Okay, so bottom line, adaptedness. So uh, Meyer makes the point that he doesn't like to talk much about adaptation, rather adaptedness. In other words, here is the relationship between structure and function, okay? So I want to um, also look at, um, let me move this out of the way a little bit to make my whiteboard bigger. This is just from the handout outline that I said to you uh, earlier on the, um, sorry, let me write. Again, does it let me write? That's strange, I can open it, but it's not active. Okay, let me do the thing that I cheat here. We're writing something. <laughs> it's the outline that I sent you by email together with the PowerPoint presentation. I'm just trying to give myself a temporary chalkboard here. The dictum form follows function. Uh, hopefully that's large enough, you can see it. And remember how I had spoken to you earlier about um, that this is a dictum or a saying or phrase that is in that we use a lot in science, form follows function and not the other way around. In other words, the structure of the thing is according to the function of the thing and not the other way around, all right? It's not that um, the function develops from the structure, but rather the structure develops from the function. Mm -hmm. So you have to, 
think about this a little bit, reflect on it. Uh, first, a clarification that form um, is we, there's a difference if we're talking science or we're talking philosophy or theology. Structure, structure, what's wrong with this? Structure. Is according to the function of the thing according according ding <laughs> okay uh see just getting fancy here. Anyway, what I'm saying is that uh, first a clarification about form, because in science, when we mention form, in empirical science, when we mention form, we actually mean shape, okay, shape. Oh, my spelling today. But in philosophy and theology, form is substance, right? The substance, which is very different. It's the essence, grammatically, the substantive or the noun, the, the it, the quit est, quit est, the what is it? But back to empirical science, which we are in this first half of the, of the course, we're talking about the shape, the structure. And this is important because we, uh, then Meyer is looking at adaptedness, he's looking at structures functionally, functionally, all right? So uh, when he sees a fish, for example, he say, oh, uh, an organism uh, that swims and survives uh, underwater. Mm -hmm. So all the structures will be according to that function or uh, when he sees uh, a human, he say, okay, a bipedal mammal, bipedal mammal. Uh, a mammal who reproduces uh, with uh, placental, we can even specify a placental mammal, right? Uh, who is bipedal, who walks only on two legs. And therefore the forward arms, the four limbs, F-O-R-E, that's I have here, uh, uh, four limbs here, that's a single word, means the forward appendages, right? What we call the arms, including the hands, are free to do things, to grasp, and to make objects and machinery. That's a huge, huge evolutionary advantage to have the hands free, first to make weapons to defend ourselves against the tiger or the lion who is chasing us, and then later to make stuff for survival, like a tent, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So adaptedness, he's thinking functional. So the whole lecture really, it's gonna be about the relationship between structure and function and how on average, the, the organisms that we see around us, when we look out the window, uh, we see plants, animals, fungi, bacteria uh, with or without instruments, uh, the aid of instruments, we see that on, on average, these are the most adapted organisms that are living today. And so we don't see evolution as such, we see the consequence of evolution. We see the consequence of evolution. Let's go back a little bit here. See, it's an a posteriori event. In other words, what we're seeing is the consequence, not the, the origin uh, or, or the process itself. We're just seeing the result. It's like looking at a painting. We don't see the artist painting normally. When we go to a museum, we see just the painting itself, right? But there was a process that generated that painting, including whatever medium it is, if the painter is using oils or synthetics or uh, watercolors, et cetera, et cetera, or pieces of cloth, et cetera. Uh, art today is very creative. All right. so. 
Yeah, these are some concepts that I'll go back and forth. Uh, placenta mammals I talked about, right? The, uh, the embryo that has a placenta connected to the mother and there's a gestational uh, period that is internal. There's internal gestation. Uh, that has all kinds of uh, consequences, advantages and disadvantages, but the overall is an advantage because mammals, placental mammals have become typically the higher on the pyramid of uh, food and uh, the, the, upper, the upper levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, the largest one, not necessarily by number, but the largest in size. Mm -hmm. You think of uh, whales, for example, marine mammals. You think of uh, cattle. Well, there was artificial selection going on there, but in nature, uh, natural selection, elephants, for example, and so forth, tend to be the largest animals in general by bulk, by biomass, are uh, the mammals. And so that is at least an association and maybe even a correlation to placental gestation. Mm -hmm. All right. So structure and function. For example, every animal, every organism that we see around today on average is well adapted to their environment. So if it's an aquatic environment, here is uh, uh, a fish that needs to survive immersed in water, immersed in water. Now, the first thing we should know about water, natural water, whether it's the ocean, the lakes, uh, the estuaries, uh, where uh, river meets the, the ocean itself, etc., water has oxygen dissolved in it, all right? Certainly the atmosphere that we're breathing right now has oxygen, but it's not 100% oxygen. It's not pure oxygen, right? Some people are pure oxygen because of some kind of uh, lung issue, but uh, they carry the little oxygen tank around, but no. Uh, the atmosphere has about 16% oxygen, more or less. Most of the atmosphere is actually nitrogen, N2 gas, nitrogen, which we call inert. It's an inert gas. It comes in and out of our lungs. and doesn't do anything at room temperature and standard pressure, right? And it's about 75% of the atmosphere, more or less, is nitrogen, N2, diatomic acid, nitrogen. But there's also oxygen, and that's a good thing because we need oxygen to live, right? Cellular respiration. A lot of this we covered uh, in the environmental bioethics course, which we'll repeat for uh, the uh, newer cohort um, coming up. Anyway, so uh, there is oxygen, O2 gas, that is dissolved in water, in the water uh, column. Right? And that oxygenation, where do you think it happens? It happens at the surface of the water. Again, whether it's fresh water, salt water, or brackish water. Uh, it's at the surface, yes. Um, horrible installing today. Right. It happens at the surface. Okay, because that's where uh, mixture, that's where there is. Mm, the surface tension of the water of the water can be broken and integrate some of the oxygen that is in the atmosphere into uh, the the water column itself. So water has uh, liquid water has oxygen in it. Mm? Um, uh, oxygen gas, right? Okay, so that's the first thing we need to know so that uh, that oxygen then can be extracted, but it's, it's coated, all those oxygen molecules are coated or are bond with the uh, loose, um, they're dissolved, actually it's a dissolved, it's a gas that is dissolved in the water column. And so the proper structure to filter out of water oxygen is the gills. Because the gills, what happens is the gills increase the amount of surface by a huge amount, the surface, right? So each gill has these little, they're called laminae, one lamina or lamella, one lamella, several lamellae. You just put an E at the end. Here's the, the, the Latin <laughs> uh, added value. One lamella, several lamellae. 
you can see that these little structures are connectors between mm, veins and capillaries. Uh, there are capillaries that connect veins and arteries, right? Or oxygen rich blood, which is typically depicted in red and oxygen poor blood or blood vessels that is typically uh, just uh, colored in blue. But the red is the important thing. Why is oxygen rich blood uh, painted in red, pictured in red, whether it's the vessel or the actual blood itself, because oxygen poor blood is also red, but it's a bluish red. It's a deeper, darker bluish, like a purple color, all right? It's not actually blue, mm -hmm. but oxygen rich blood is more reddish. That's because of oxidation precisely. Keep in mind that hemoglobin is the, the protein that carries uh, oxygen in the blood, right? And at the hemoglobin center of the molecule is an iron atom. It's a one iron atom. It's called a heme group, H-E-M-E. -E. And that heme group, is what makes the RBCs, the red blood cells, <laughs> amazing. They show you all the protein and they don't show you the, 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 the iron. Oh, okay, good, they do. Here it is, right? So hemoglobin is a, a structural protein, uh, it's a functional protein that, that is made up of four subunits. Each one of this is a myoglobin subunit. They're all identical to each other, but they conform in different ways so that they form the hemoglobin complex. And inside each myoglobin is a, what is known as a heme group. In other words, in here, there is an actual iron. Uh, let's see, maybe I'll make it bigger. Cannot make it bigger. All right, that's all right. So anyway, there's an iron Fe uh, atom here, and that becomes FeO2. <laughs> at the lungs, it uh, it gets oxidized, right? And what's another word for oxidation? Rust. And rust is a reddish, orangey, brown color. So when iron oxidizes, it becomes reddish. And that's what makes the RBC R. That's what makes the red blood cell look red. And that's what makes blood look red. So imagine how much iron there is in the blood. In fact, it's one of the things that is measured in the in the chemical panel of a blood sample to see if the person is anemic or not. Because if the person has low iron in the blood, then they're not transporting enough oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the body, to the tissues of the body for functioning. And the person becomes weak, anemic, right? So that's the whole thing about iron. Then once the the iron drops off that oxygen at every cell of our body in tissues, it picks up, it doesn't go back empty, it doesn't go back empty to the lungs, it picks up a CO2, which is a byproduct of cellular respiration, remember? It picks up CO2 and takes it to the lungs so that the lungs can then expel that out into the environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's the gas exchange there. Anyway, going back to the gills, so when uh, for terrestrial animals, we can do that very easily or fairly easily by the lungs. And the alveoli also increase the surface area inside the lungs. But lungs themselves are not sufficient. They don't have enough surface area to uh, absorb oxygen in water because water has much less oxygen dissolved in it than there is in the atmosphere, right? So in other words, what I'm trying to say about this is that the surface area of capillaries has to be increased many fold in water in order to absorb enough oxygen to keep that organism alive, to keep that animal alive, which typically are fish or they can be amphibians in the early stage and the larval stage, like tadpoles, for example, right? Before they become frogs on land or toads. All right, so that increase in surface is done by these little lamellae. And so there are thousands and thousands of lamellae in each uh, gill hair, if you will, or gill filament. 
gill filament, and then together, the filaments make up the actual gill. You notice that proportionally, the number of uh, filaments and lamellae and gills as such, proportionally to the biomass of the whole fish, is a greater amount than the alveoli of the lungs of an animal on land, terrestrially. So we can compare even, for example, the lungs of elephants, which uh, we can intuit that those lungs are huge, right? Because the chest area and the abdominal area, but the chest area of, of uh, elephants are pretty large. I'm just thinking one of the largest animals on land. Uh, yet the, uh, it can maintain that large animal on land, uh, but proportionally fish are smaller proportionally to the number of gills they have because again, there's less oxygen dissolved in water than there is in the atmosphere, which by the way, keep in mind that the atmosphere is also a fluid, but it's a much lighter fluid. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the molecules are more loosely uh, uh, contained in the atmosphere that they are in water. Okay, so the big picture here is that gills are perfectly adapted or best adapted for obtaining oxygen uh, in the water column than they would be, for example, lungs. Lungs could not survive uh, without coming to the surface and breathing from, from the surface, right? So that's an example there, a very clear example that has been studied extensively, as you can see, percentage of oxygen and so forth that is trapped by the capillaries from the water column to maintain that fish uh, alive without ever having to come to breathe from the surface. Now, I did mention uh, earlier that there are some fish that actually have a little structure inside their throat that is in addition to the gills and allows them to go up air from the surface. It's called a labyrinth. And some fish have that. I mentioned it with the beta splendens with the Siamese uh, fighting fish. They have labyrinths, so they can uh, live uh, in a bowl without having oxygenation from the surface, but it does stress the fish. Guppies can do that. Goldfish can do also do that. A number of fish uh, species or groups can breathe from the surface, but not all of them, right? Most fish, especially in the ocean and even in freshwater, uh, do not have that labyrinth, and therefore they need to have enough oxygen in the water to, to breathe. So if the water becomes stagnant, they die, they asphyxiate to death because they can absorb, they cannot absorb enough oxygen through their gills. So this is a very good example of the structure adapting to the function of breathing and not vice versa, right? All right, so we can make the same argument for flight, for example. How are the structures of a bird best adapted for flight? Well, in flight, of course, the big thing is to defy gravity, and therefore we want to keep the weight as light as possible. And birds generally are very light compared to a similar animal, for example, on land. In other words, the size of the bird is very light compared to a similar size animal on land, okay? Uh, because their structures are very light, and so the the myomass of the same size of a, of a bird or uh, let's say a mammal on land, mm -hmm. the same size, which one's gonna be lighter by density, by biomass, the bird is gonna be lighter. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at uh, the structures that make that bird lighter beyond the feathers, which obviously are very light. You can think of a feather as a super, super fancy hair that has extended is mostly keratin, just like the hair is also made out of keratin and so forth. It's a, mostly proteins, uh, but they're very, very light in weight compared to uh, their, uh, their size. But also internally, the internal skeleton, which they have an internal skeleton, right? They're vertebrates. Many of their bones are hollow. So by making the bone hollow, it makes them more fragile but at the same time, it makes them lighter so that they can escape into flight. And they just have to be careful about things falling on top of them because they can be crunched 
more easily, but they can also fly away, right? And so by the bones becoming hollow over evolutionary time, the birds have actually adapted to uh, flight. Mm -hmm. Also, another adaptation is that the forward limbs had to become available for flying as opposed to crawling around. So even though uh, they are tetrapods because they have four limbs, right? The forward limbs, the four limbs, uh, F-O-R-E, are available for flight as opposed to the hind limbs, which are available for grasping, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, for landing and for grasping up to twigs, branches, etc. Okay, so that's another example of form follows function. The structure of the thing is according to the function of the thing. If the bird is meant to fly, then you better have light structures uh, to minimize the gravitational pull. And one way of doing that is by having hollow bones. Let's look at um, reptiles different varieties of reptiles, turtles, snakes, and lizards. So these guys are what is known as ectoderms, uh, uh, ectotherms, ectotherms. Yes, this is some of the, look at some of the words, a little bit of vocabulary here. Mm. Yes, forward limbs I talked about. So ectotherms, uh, again, uh, some Latin therm, a thermometer refers to temperature, right? Um, ecto is external. In other words, they are also known as cold blooded, not because they're mean or cruel to their kin, but rather because they cannot hold on to the heat. So the body produces heat. Every body produces heat because it's a byproduct of metabolism and especially cellular respiration. Another word for respiration is burning glucose. And burn is a caloric reaction, right? It releases heat as a byproduct. And that heat can either be retained by the body or not. The way that is retained by the body is mostly by either hairs or feathers. Mm -hmm. And because what hairs or feathers do is that they hold on to the air immediately around them which is called a veneer, mm. hair, veneer around hair, a veneer, <laughs> yes, a veneer. So, oh, it's giving me <laughs> some kind of creature here, artifact. No, what I want is, uh, Let's see. No, not that either. How <laughs> uh, about just hair veneer? A veneer is a layer of. Uh, I saw right here. I don't know that. Veneering? Veneer. No, it's going to be some kind of instrument that women use for their hairs, but um, um, about endotherms. <laughs> Let's see. Well, what I wanted to show was, uh, well, how about uh, skin hair? <laughs> Let's generalize it to mammals. All right. Well, we're gonna have to stick to one of these models here. The hair is sticking out, right? So we're familiar with mammals, lots of hair all over the place. But what happens with the hair is that hair holds on to a veneer of air around it. 
a little bit of air is trapped in the hair, okay? It's uh, like a flow of air is trapped around the hair. <laughs> and that layer of air gets warmed up from the heat that is coming out of the body in mammals. And so it's a layer of insulation. So the hair makes a layer, an air layer of insulation. Again, think about this a little bit, <laughs> reflect on it. Where's my chalkboard? Air in mammals, of course, uh, makes uh, uh, traps, traps uh, veneer, which is a layer of air for insulation. In other words, the air warms up. by the heat that is released from the body mm, through metabolism. And therefore, that layer of air is trapped there and it serves as insulation. We're able to maintain our body temperature due to the hair. And so generally there is a lot of hair in uh, mammals. Uh, those won't be, <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, there's a general lot of hair in wild animals. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we also have hair all over the place. Of course, what's been, um, we have been getting rid of hair on our body over millennia by the use of clothing. <laughs> because when we use clothing artificially, we're substituting the hair. And so there has been less need for hair or less hairy individuals have been surviving uh, and reproducing over millennia since we've been wearing clothing. Uh, and so we have generally less hair than other animals uh, in the wildlife, okay, due to our clothing. <laughs> anyway, that's why a fan, when it's warm and we stand in front of a fan uh, without the clothing, <laughs> what happens is uh, that fan pushes away the veneer of warm air that we have around us. Uh, we can start with the arms and legs, for example, if we're wearing shorts and t-shirt and we stand in front of a fan on a hot day, on a warm day, what happens is that that fan, that air will blow away the veneer of air that is around that arms and legs and will cool us down. See? So, uh, <clears throat> Why that? Oh yeah, so hair is a very good adaptation to cold environments. And that's why mammals have been able to survive in winter environments and so forth uh, up north and also up the mountains with vertical stratification of the, uh, of the weather where it gets colder. And those are known as endotherms. Uh, where is that? Yeah endotherms, but ectotherms do not have hair. Instead, they have scales. So fish and reptiles are ectotherms, right? Obviously fish have scales, and, but it's the same origin, which is keratin protein. So again, you can think of a scale as a flattened out hair. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, now it's easy to see the scales in uh, snakes and uh, lizards. It's harder to see scales in, in uh, turtles, but these are the scales, the plates. These are actual scales that have fused together and they're also fused inside with the rib cage. So the rib cage goes around the turtle internally, all right? And the ribs have actually fused to the scales, but the outside, uh, these are scales, these plates are adapted, super adapted scales. Anyway, my whole point about this is that reptiles are ectotherms. They are not able to hold on to their heat. And so they have to warm up when it's cooler or the water gets uh, colder. What happens because water is constantly absorbing heat from the animals, from the organism. That's why we get cold in, 
in water after a period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they come out to sun themselves. They're sunning themselves, meaning that they are uh, warming up. They're warming up their bodies by the sunlight. But of course, that exposes them more to UV radiation. And so the scales have become thicker, larger, to try to minimize exposure to radiation, to UV radiation uh, from sunlight. See? And so there has been uh, a combination of factors there coming out for sunning. Well, uh, the ones that were less adapted to UV, they got warm, but they also got cancer <laughs> mutation, right? Uh, so get, they got selected out. And uh, the ones, the reptiles that we see today around us is because they have their scales are thick enough and amber color enough and opaque enough to keep the UV out from the body from uh, uh, mutating their DNA. All right, let's look at mammals. Let's look at birds and mammals, actually. The knee, the development of the knee. Of course, the knee in mammals bends forward, right? Bends forward. The knee in mammals bends forward. And we think that the, bee, the knee in birds bends backwards, but it doesn't. The knee in birds also bends forward because in birds, what we're looking at is not the knee, but actually the calf. In birds, what we're looking at on their hind legs, the articulation or the, the hinge is not the knee, but the calf. And the calf bend, bends backwards in mammals. So let's look at that. There is a structure of a super large bird, maybe an ostrich or something like that. And here's a human. So we got fever, tibia, tarsus, and metatarsus. So the femur and the tibia are part of the leg. The tarsus and the metatarsus are part of the foot, right? The metatarsus being the fingers, the digits, or the toes. So here's a femur for the human, bipedal femur, the longest bone in the body, typically what determines uh, the, the biggest determinant of our height. And then the tibia, the lower leg, the knee in between tibia and uh, femur bends forward is the hinge. If the leg needs to bend and move for walking, then it better have a hinge on it, uh, which is the knee. Whereas the calf is down here, right, for the foot. 90 degree angle so that the foot is, again, adapted for walking on two legs. Look at the femur of birds. So the femur is the bone that is connected to the hip bone. So the hip bone, okay, which is the one that takes up the weight from the upper body. So here's the hip bone on mammals and birds. And then the femur is actually embedded inside the body of the bird. So we don't see it normally. We don't see it uh, looking at, it, at the bird from the outside. But the femur is embedded in there. And so there's the articulation of the knee in birds. It's embedded inside the bird. <laughs> And then what we're seeing projecting out that looks like a femur is actually the tibia, all right? Which is generally the longest bone in the, uh, in the bird. And then the torsus has adapted to also be vertical, to project vertically. And this articulation here is the equivalent of the calf for humans or for mammals. And then you have the metatarsi, which are the digits, the fingers of the bird or claws, right? The digits of the bird, which have been elongated for grabbing on twigs, etc. right? So really birds, even though Functionally, it looks like the knee is bending backward. That's not a real knee, <laughs> all right? Functionally, it serves the same function. And it's a better adaptation, actually. 
So which is better for the knee to bend forward or backward? There's less effort in moving the animal forward with a backward bending knee than a forward bending knee. There's less effort. <laughs> in other words, it's easier for an animal to project forward, to move forward, even to run faster by a backward, by, by the hinge being backwards instead of forward. It's more effort. Any runner can tell you that uh, uh, it's quite an effort to move with a, to run with a knee that's bending forward. There's a whole kinetics of it. If our knee were to bend backward, we would run faster. Experiments have been done, simulation, you can do a simulation in the computer. You don't even need to construct a robot or anything like that. You just uh, digitalize a human in the computer and then reverse the knee backwards and then uh, do a program to, to move it forward and to it will run faster, quicker than with the knee bending forward, all right? So birds figure it out early on and it worked, so it stayed. If it works, nature doesn't change it. <laughs> when birds evolved from dinosaurs that had little tiny hands like the, uh, uh, yes, like the T-Rex, for example, uh, huge hind legs, right? The backward bending knee, the pseudo knee, it's actually the calf, can uh, make the animal run faster and run away from prey. Hmm? even before they develop flight. Okay, so there it is. Mm. Form follows function. Another adaptation, precisely internal skeleton. Since we're looking at the uh, uh, mammal, at uh, vertebrates here, right? Talked about uh, ectoderm, endoderm. Okay, these others are gonna go into plants. Let's look at uh, the whole group of the vertebrates that I've been talking about, the five uh, groups of vertebrates, the five major groups. Uh, actually, yes, uh, chordates. There are a couple of other groups of chordates that are not vertebrates, uh, but I'm sticking to the vertebrates, the five classes, uh, um, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. We all have what is known as an internal skeleton, internal skeleton is kind of the best of the both worlds. So you notice it's both, it's all three environments, the aquatic environment, the terrestrial environment, and the air environment, right? So mammal um, vertebrates have been able to conquer all three big environments in uh, nature on earth as we see them, the water, the land, and the air. Mm -hmm. Vertebrates uh, have been able to do that. Now, and they have done that with an exo, with an endoskeleton to a large size. There's another large group, it's another phylum that has done that also, and they have an ectoskeleton, but generally they tend to stay very small. And those are the arthropods. That's the one that uh, I show here. I'll get to those uh, later, but let's stay with the vertebrates for now. Endoskeleton. I say has the best of both worlds in this sense. First, it gives rigidity to the body. It gives rigidity to the body uh, so that the body can be, gives an internal structure on which we can put uh, meat, which is muscles, and we can also have internal organs protected and so forth. Uh, for example, the rib cage, they all have ribs. Even fish have uh, ribs. Uh, of course, amphibians have little ribs, that they have them. Mammals, for sure. Birds also have ribs. And for sure, the reptiles have a lot of ribs. <laughs> okay, so that protects the internal organs, which are the typically viral organs, the mm, digestive organs, uh, the digestive system, the uh, respiratory system, and also even the nervous system is enclosed within the spinal cord within the uh, vertebrae. So it's a double advantage. The one advantage is give rigidity. In other words, give an internal structure to the animal. But the other one is also articulation gives that rigidity flexibility to move around, to move around either by swimming 
or by walking or jumping or crawling or by flying. All right, so the internal structure of the endoskeleton is also articulated, articulated. And that's what makes us vertebrates. What's that make all of these five classes of, of uh, animals vertebrate? They have vertebrae, which is a spinal cord that is articulated, right? So that's the best of both worlds. It gives rigidity and flexibility at the same time, mostly for locomotion. So big advantage there in the endoskeleton that is articulated, mm -hmm. what we call the skeletal system. Now, there's another example in mm, a group that is known as the arthropods, arthropods. And this is kind of a counterpoint to the vertebrates because the vertebrates have an endoskeleton, but these guys have an exoskeleton. And the word, again, the Latin, getting a lot of Latin in this lecture today, pod is a reference to legs, podia, the feet or the legs in general. And arthro is articulation, articulation. So they have articulated legs is what the phylum means, arthropods. There's a great variety of them. Crustaceans like crabs and lobsters and shrimp and all that, or Mm, arachnids, arachnids like the uh, scorpions and uh, mm, people are afraid of spiders, <laughs> okay? Or the insects like uh, grasshoppers or mealworms or flies or lepidoptans, lepidop, lepidop. It's are the uh, butterflies and moths, centipedes and millipedes, you name it. There are many classes of the arthropods, all right? But they all have uh, a couple, at least a couple of common characteristics. They are all exoskeletons. They're on the crunchy. These are the crunchy animals, right? Uh, when they cr get crushed, they crunch. So they have an exoskeleton, which is mostly chitin. It's another protein that hardens with air or with water. And then uh, they also molt. So they have to come out of their skeleton periodically, shed the skeleton, which is a molt, and then develop a new exoskeleton uh, in a few hours or a few days. And they stay in seclusion at that time because they're, they're soft and vulnerable. For example, soft shell blue crabs is precisely when the blue crab is molting, coming out and leaving behind the, the shell, the exoskeleton, and growing a new uh, skeleton, uh, hardening the shell around them or the skeleton. And that takes maybe one, two days, so they're in hiding at the time. But uh, when these are cultivated now in marine farms, then uh, that's a soft shell blue crab. Right, that uh, you can eat the whole thing because everything is soft and they're delicious, by the way. They're kind of expensive, they come from farms, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, the other thing, so one common characteristic of all the arthropods is that they have the exoskeleton, but the other characteristic is that they have articulated legs, right? Joints for movement. And even the, the pincers are uh, super adapted legs. So they're no longer used as legs, even though the crab does use the legs a little bit for moving around the, uh, the pincers, uh, the claws, but they have true legs uh, that work better that way, et cetera. Also the, the uh, scorpions have developed uh, little claws or pincers. And the antennae are also super adapted. Appendages, the antennae, are also articulated. In other words, they're segmented, right? And all arthropods, they have antennae of some way. Some are very tiny. Others are more visible and pretty large, like the lobster, etc. Okay, so this is in the mm, invertebrate, in the non-vertebrates uh, group of animals. Adaptation, a great variety of adaptation with the same basic body plan. Oh, also with regards to the body plan, the body plan, the, typically the core of the, of the body, the main body has three parts, uh, which is uh, head, abdomen, and uh, head, thorax, and abdomen, okay? Head, thorax, and abdomen. And sometimes 
the head and the thorax are fused together in what is known as a cephalothorax, cephalothorax. For example, that's uh, very true of the arachnids, of uh, spiders and uh, scorpions. Also the millipedes, you see, well, here's the head, here's the thorax, and the rest is abdomen, uh, which is again segmented or articulated. The butterfly does have a head, a thorax, in a uh, separate, and then the abdomen behind is hidden behind the, the wings. Mm -hmm. The wings are super adapted appendages, by the way, sticking out of the thorax. In the grasshopper, you can again see the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen. The abdomen typically is larger, is a larger structure, and it contains usually the reproductive organs. The thorax contains most of the other organs, including uh, gills or um, tubular uh, lungs. And the head is mostly the cephalic region where you have a primitive brain. And uh, the eyes, whether there are simple eyes or compound eyes, are located on the head. All right, so all very well adapted to a variety of survival today in water, on land, and in the air. Other adaptation, again, uh, focusing on the wings of uh, birds. Many different shapes of wings, many different shapes, but the basics of variety of shapes, variation, right? Variation according to the different type of flight that they do. Some have very long flights, so they'll use large wings. For example, the albatross that can stay flying for days or weeks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even without flapping their wings much, they're just dry. Uh, gliding on the uh, air currents and and uh, and, and uh, in the air column thermal thermal air that is rising right air columns that are rising whenever you see birds that are circling you we see them locally the vultures that circle for example the buzzard the black buzzard uh, which is our native uh, buzzard <laughs> Bird of carrion, uh, buzzards, buzzards um, on a thermal column, right? And you see them around. They go around and around. So let's see if that shows uh, maybe in uh, videos. <laughs> You look up and you see the buzzers going around and around. Uh, let's move it forward. So here's just one. They're just gliding. Not, not a very good video. Maybe this one. It's got two buzzards. <laughs> well, same. Well, these two buzzers seem to be doing something. I don't know if it's a mating ritual, but uh, anyway, well, whenever next time you see a buzzard, uh, look at them. They're they're going around and around in circles. They're actually at the perimeter of a thermal. You can think of a column of air, of hot air, warm air that is rising because warmth rises, right? Warm air rises, warm water rises in the column, and it literally forms an invisible column of air that is rising, slowly but surely. And so what these buzzers do, they get on the edge of that, and they ride around and ride around, like a course crew description, the trajectory, until they get very high. And then sometimes you see a whole colony of them, 5, 10, 20, going around and around the column. They get high, and then they get off the column, and then they start gliding horizontally off the air column, looking for another thermal, maybe that thermal has begin, has begun to lose its uh, strength, its energy. So they get off the column or they're going elsewhere <laughs> and move along. And then it, they form like a string. Mm -hmm. They form a whole uh, pattern, uh, a single file, if you will. And then they start rotating again. They just got into another uh, column. All right, stop. So, those pairs, uh, the wings are adapted for doing that. 
a very sharp contrast of the wings of penguins, which are used for uh, actually swimming underwater, swimming underwater. Mm, I'm delaying too much, so I'm not going to look at videos of that, but you can look at videos of penguins actually swimming underwater. They have a funny mechanism. It looks like they're paddling uh, with oars, okay? So they use the, uh, the wings as oars. They're very different within the structure of a wing, right? An appendage that is propagated out from the body is the forward limb, but at the level of detail, adapted for their environment as opposed to flying. Penguins, very awkward flight. Some of them can't even fly anymore. Um, and so, but they're very well adapted for swimming underwater. Mm -hmm. And so a great variety of uh, feathers. This is of course the phenotype because it's the expression of a genotype, right? The expression of a genotype and the different feathers will be used by different birds. And even within the same species of bird, different types of feathers, depending where they are on the body. The feathers of the wings are gonna be different from the feathers on the body of the animal, All right? So even within the individual, there's variety of feathers. So variety rules, that was Darwin's, one of Darwin's things point. There is variety, there's variation all over the place. That, that variation is a result of adapted nets, of adapted nets, according to the function. Uh, now, I've been talking about animals so far, How about the plant kingdom, yes, and the plants also. The plants are well adapted to their own environment. For example, when we look at conifers, conifers are also known as pine trees, and then conifers are very well adapted to harsh, cold winter environment, better than the other non-conifers, uh, trees that are known as deciduous. All right, deciduous trees. Oh, I don't know what have anymore. Okay, so conifers, I don't have it here. Let's put it. Oh, it doesn't let me. All right, okay. So let me go to my whiteboard. <laughs> All right. Oh. So trees are either conifers or deciduous. Deciduous is that they shed their leaves. Let me see if I spell it correctly. Deciduous. Oh, correct my spelling. Oh yeah, I got it right. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, so what happens is deciduous trees lose their leaves precisely in the fall up north. All right, so here's an example, deciduous uh, trees and evergreen. So deciduous trees in the fall, they drop their leaves and that's why the fall is called fall. Uh, a more scientific name for fall is autumn, autumn. All right, so in, in the fall, when what happens in the fall up north? The weather is changing from warm to cold. And so the citrus trees do not tolerate the cold. They're basically, it's their pigment, the photosynthetic pigment dies. The chlorophylls die, they are denature, disintegrate. And so the for, uh, there are um, mostly four different types of uh, chlorophylls. Uh, chlorophylls, there are the alpha and beta chlorophylls, and then there is the sanctophylls <clears throat> and the carotenes. Four chlorophylls, well, oh, actually four photosynthetic pigments, photosynthetic pigments, Okay, so this is the four main ones. Uh, they go by various names, but uh, you have chlorophylls, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, 
Then you have the zancto, the carotenes, which are orangey color, and then the zanctophils, which are reddish color. Right? Those are the four uh, main uh, groups of photosynthetic pigments. The alpha and beta chlorophylls, one is more bluish, the other one is green. Then the carotenes, which are orangey color, and then the zanctophils, which are reddish uh, color. And what happens is that the more delicate ones, the ones that tolerate less cold, are the alpha and beta chlorophylls. So all of these pigments are in the leaf. All four pigments are in the leaf, in any leaf. It's just that we see mostly the green because they're more abundant. Alpha and beta chlorophylls are more abundant in a leaf, so we see them more. But there are also carotenes and sanctophils in the leaf, uh, with this uh, in a leaf. So it shows kind of the proportion. Uh, well, okay, so we can use a diagram like this, for example. This is the same species, I think it's actually a croton or something like that. Uh, so alpha and beta chlorophylls are more abundant in the leaf, but the Carotenes and the sanctophils are also there in lesser amount. And so there's an overwhelming greenery to the leaf. You see more green, we see more green because it's the more abundant pigment, but the orange and red pigments are also there. When the green and the blue green start dying off, denaturing the yellow, the orange, yellow, and red pigments survive for a little longer time in the cold weather, in the cooler weather. And that's why we get that turning of the leaves, the turning of the leaves, right? They turn from green into the variety of reddish colors. And that is the fall uh, season is kicking in because the leaves are falling off, the ones that are dying. And uh, at the peak of the reddish, Right up north, people go to watch this spectacular site in the temperate regions. At the peak of it, it's called piping, piping, and it may only be like a few days or a week at most or something like that, where the whole forest is at its maximum yellow, orange, red color. Mm -hmm. The Carolinas and further north. Uh, so people go look at that in the fall. Uh, uh, they call it piping again. And then eventually, even the sanctophil and the carotenes die because they cannot tolerate the more cold weather. And so the leaf starts turning brown, <laughs> okay? And a brown leaf that is not photosynthesizing is gonna die and start rotting. So it decays and falls off. And then they fall off and they cover the ground with leaves, okay? And that's the fall season, also known as autumn. And then eventually winter comes in. So winter, when winter kicks in, that tree looks barren, no leaves on it. So it looks dead, right? If we had a barren tree like that here in the tropics, that tree is dead <laughs> because we don't have a change in seasons that drastically. <clears throat> but in the up north, that tree is not dead. It is hibernating. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> those are called deciduous trees. In contrast to that, the uh, non-deciduous trees are known as evergreen. <laughs> and the evergreens are the conifers. Because conifers have certain adaptations that allow them to survive the winter and stay green. And that's why they're called evergreen because they stay green during the winter in contrast with deciduous trees. Now, what are some of those adaptations to harsh winter environments? The most obvious ones are the needles and the cones. So conifers, pine trees, they have needles instead of leaves. And you can see there's very little accumulation of snow on top of a needle in contrast to a leaf. A leaf would accumulate a lot of uh, snow and would break off because snow is water that is heavy. Over time, accumulation of snow gets heavy and so would break that leaf off. But a needle accumulates very little snow, right? 
Also a cone instead of a flower. So a cone is woody, hard, and it can survive that winter because, hmm, get rid of this right the cone is actually the reproductive structure of the pine tree and you can see it's woody and in the winter it's closed like this and then it's spring it springs forth you know it opens up when it warms it's mostly a temperature thing that makes the cone open up a little bit and expose it to the pollen so that the eggs that are inside, there's generally two eggs per scale. Each one of these structures is called a scale, right? And there are two eggs at the base of it near the core that are waiting to be fertilized or not by the pollen, which is gonna be flying around in the millions as we saw uh, earlier uh, uh, photos. Okay, so these are two obvious adaptations for harsh winter environment, but also two others that are, uh, internal, we don't see, or on the ground. So the uh, pine trees typically have a tap root system. So they have a tap root or a principal root that goes deep and the lateral roots go sideways, of course, but deciduous trees typically don't have tap roots. They don't have a principal root, a main root that goes down. That is very similar. So it's a structure analogous or similar to the shoot of the plant. So that uh, that I have in the words here, I think, uh, shoot and yes. So any plant that we look at, any plant that we look at in nature structurally has two parts to it. Any plant, whether you're thinking of the smallest little herb of grass or to the largest uh, trees that we ever uh, encounter in nature, structurally they have two parts. One part that we see and another part that we don't see. So obviously the part that we don't see is the root system that is below the ground, below the surface. Generally, we don't see the roots. We may just see very little bit of the root sometimes projecting out, but the, the root system is below the ground generally and is unseen, but it's a, it's a whole ecosystem down there, right? And then the shoot system is what shoots up above ground, typically the part of the plant that we do see, all right? And it's just called the shoot system because it actually shoots out from the ground above, uh, looking for light and going against gravity at the same time, right? So the tropism, the movement is a positive phototropism and a negative geotropism. So the shoot system. Uh, the shoot system of conifer, the root system of conifers, the root system of pine trees, generally is at least the size of the shoot. So you look at any pine tree and you can estimate that below ground, the root system of any pine tree is at least as large as what is shooting up as a shoot system of what we can see. And sometimes it's two to four times bigger. The root system is two to four times longer, deeper than the shoot system of some conifers. All right, like our slash pine here in the forest at St. Thomas is anywhere between two to four times the shoot system. The root system is two to four times deeper, longer than what we see above ground. So huge root system going down into the ground. And so they can find water, humidity further down there that the deciduous trees don't find more with lateral roots, with secondary roots that go, don't go as deep. And finally, the fourth adaptation is that conifers internally, they have uh, resin instead of sap. So sap typically is a white milky substance. Sap or resin. Whereas uh, resin is not a sap milky substance. So here is uh, resin, right? Uh, let's see, sap, sap, sap. Here is a sap. So sap is a white milky substance that <clears throat> has a lot of water content in it. Let me, <clears throat> it can be collected like maple syrup, sap. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
white milky substance that has high water content. And so it tends to freeze or become sluggish in the, um, in the winter. And therefore circulation kind of slows down to a minimal or even stops in the tree when the tree is hibernating up north. Hmm? Whereas resin, resin is an amber color, uh, thick substance that has very little water content, is more oily, hmm? and therefore it doesn't freeze in the winter. It doesn't freeze in the winter and it stays moving through the tree internally, sluggishly from the roots to the shoots, to the, to the needles and so forth, but it continues to circulate inside the tree in the winter time. And so the conifers, the pine trees stay green in the winter and that's also why they're called evergreen. And that's their leg up, if you will, for growth and survival as opposed to the deciduous trees that have to hibernate or have to uh, become dormant during the winter. So even in plants, adaptations, the plants that we see around us today in any uh, environment are the best adapted for today's climate, which has been like this for thousands of years. Remember, climate is long-term in contrast to weather, which is uh, short-term and changing. It's a very dynamic system that changes from day to day. All right. So. Uh, for example, again, we're thinking here of structure and function mm, globally. When we look at uh, mammals, we see three general adaptations in the big picture of the mammals, the hair, hairy vertebrates, mm, where we have basental mammals, we have marsupials, and we have egg-laying mammals, even egg-laying uh, this thing is called a platypus. It has hair, but it lays eggs. So there's no placenta. Mm? And there's even no internal gestation. So the, the creature, the mammal, the platypus, duckbill platypus, actually lays an egg. And the egg has to hatch and all that. Uh, platypus. Very primitive. They live in Tasmania and uh, way down near Australia. There, uh, very strange. They're protected, endangered, etc. Mm. <laughs> See that was egg. There it is. There's a platypus, actually protecting its eggs, <laughs> and that's an actual egg. And there's a little embryo, okay? But they do have uh, mammary glands where they need to uh, suckle for growth, for development. But they hatch, the little embryo hatches out of an egg. <laughs> it's amazing. <clears throat> Very primitive, uh, way back. Then there is a marsupial. The marsupial is a little different. One here. Okay, so the marsupials, they are born, <clears throat> so they don't hatch, they're born, but they're born prematurely. They're born prematurely and they don't develop placentas. They're not placental animals. Marsupials, they're not placental. So the little embryo, here's a female kangaroo giving birth to a little uh, embryo. <laughs> Marsupial, and that little kid is actually called a kid, K-I-D. <clears throat> that little kid literally has to grow, has to uh, 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 work, work its way into the pouch, into the pouch of uh, the mother kangaroo, because inside the pouch, he or she will find a tit, one tit, that has a long nipple, and then this little embryo will proceed to swallow the nipple. That long nipple will be swallowed all the way down to the stomach, and then continue to suckle on it, right, for maintenance. So this is the equivalent <laughs> of a placenta, but it's not a placenta. It's more primitive, it's more dangerous, because the mother will not help 
the little embryo crawl into the, the pouch, okay? The embryo has to find its way from the vagina to the pouch to crawl in and then swallow that uh, tit, that, that nipple. <laughs> the evolution uh, of uh, marsupials, so they don't have a placenta. It's a much more risky, dangerous thing. And some survive, some don't survive. Uh, <clears throat> one advantage, of course, of Australia, where they live normally, naturally, is that there were no carnivores that hunted them down. There were all the, all the mammals, all the marsupials were herbivores originally. So they had a little more relaxing time for giving birth and not being chased by a carnivore that was after them to get eaten. Mm -hmm. And so there were no carnivores. And there, it's an example of parallel evolution that I'll show you a little bit after the break. But I just wanted to uh, mention that as uh, how, why there are marsupials and not placental, but the egg-laid mammals and the marsupial animals are the smaller, slow, uh, smallest uh, groups of mammals. And they live in islands, which are in the South Pacific, Australia, Tasmania, and uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Another one that lays eggs is called the echidna. Mm -hmm. Again, down in uh, New Zealand. But the more successful mammals are the placental mammals that have internal gestation, internal gestation, otherwise uh, pregnancy. And they have been able to uh, conquer and live in all continents, all continents except Antarctica, where there are no natural living mammals there. Some birds do migrate there, which are uh, penguins and so forth, but no natural living mammals because it's just way too cold, the cover of ice, and uh, you don't really have herbivores to hunt and to create the whole food chain. So no naturally living mammals uh, that we know of in uh, Antarctica today. When Antarctica was not in the South Pole or the earth was tropicalized, uh, then there was land there. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there was land exposed to, to um, that was warmer, it was not covered by, uh, by, the ice, by ice. Okay, let me stop there because it's already 11.20 and uh, we're about halfway, <laughs> but the second half is gonna go a little uh, faster. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't know if there are any questions or comments to be made at this point. I've been talking for a long time, almost two hours now, so I'm gonna stop here. All good here. Questions. No questions, questions, Professor. Okay. Thanks, Denisha. Thank you. Yeah, uh, here then. And I'll pick up uh, 1120. Okay, 1130, I'll get started again. Okay, so 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, folks, I have 1130, so I'm going to uh, continue the second half of the lecture. The second half is shorter than the first half. Okay. So it's not an arithmetical half. So we were talking about, I was talking about the whole issue of adaptation, adaptedness, and how animals and plants and even fungi, the, the major groups of organisms on land that we can see or on earth that we can see seem to be perfectly adapted, but they're not perfectly adapted. They're best adapted, okay, because they have survived. They have not been selected out as individuals of uh, species, but not perfect. So it's really, it's a work in progress. There is never uh, perfection because there are constraints. There are constraints that are, some are uh, abiotic constraints from the environment and some are biotic constraints from other organisms mm, that are typically impinging on that particular species, either by hunting them or not providing enough food, uh, limiting factors. For example, the uh, 
herbivores, they are constrained by the amount of grass or vegetation that is available to them at that particular time of the season. So if they live in the tropics, there's obviously more greenery available year round than if they live in temperate or northern regions where a lot of the vegetation goes dormant in the north like I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So those are the constraints. And that's why overall we see the greatest abundance of biodiversity in the tropics. Subtropical and subtropical region is the largest biodiversity because, and that's mostly a temperature driven issue, temperature, meaning that because it's relatively warm year round, there's enough water accessible, liquid water, and the temperature is benevolent so that it's not extreme temperatures where your many organisms, especially plants, have difficulty surviving. So, well, we can talk about the limiting factor of chlorophyll. The big benefit of chlorophyll, of course, being a photosynthetic uh, pigment is that it produces uh, glucose. It produces an organic compound of high energy, right, high calories, uh, the glucose being a carbohydrate by using inorganic compounds and light energy. So it's just fascinating what chlorophyll can do. You think about it, that pigment, it takes water, which is very abundant, liquid water, very abundant on earth, thanks be to God, uh, a lot of uh, water available. Uh, and it's an inorganic compound, right? Because it has hydrogen, but it doesn't have carbon. And it takes also CO2, which has carbon, but doesn't have hydrogen, and therefore it's also an inorganic compound, and is relatively abundant in the atmosphere. It's not that abundant. It's a point, I think it's 0.04% or something like that. It's not that abundant, but it's enough CO2 in the atmosphere that the plants can take that, combine them, put those molecules, rearrange the atoms in those molecules, uh, and the light, the, the energy source for running that, uh, for running that chemical reaction for photosynthesis, the energy source is light, light, which is natural light, which is super abundant on Earth, right? Just like in any other planet that is uh, circling around a uh, sun or a star. And so you see photosynthesis is, I mean, it's really, when you think about it in theological terms, it's miraculous in the sense that there's one, one, one chemical reaction out of millions. I mean, how many chemical reactions are occurring in nature right now? Just metabolism in our bodies, it's amazing. Of the millions of chemical reactions that occur naturally, one produces so much glucose, so much high energy carbohydrate that it runs the entire life system on earth, the entire life system. Um, based on that one chemical reaction of photosynthesis, all right? And what makes that happen structurally is the uh, chloroplast. And the chloroplast with the endobiotic, uh, endosymbiotic uh, theory uh, may have been a cyanobacteria that got, that survived <laughs> phagocytosis. Anyway, some of you already know about that. Others, we, we will cover it. In, um, in other lectures, but basically the theory of endos, endosymbiosis of taking in, of um, ingesting cells, ingesting uh, other cells. And of course, we're talking about single cell organisms uh, primitively, uh, four billion years ago, more or less, or 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago is where the cyanobacteria are supposed to have originated when they have originated. So uh, the chloroplast came about, thus generating the, the producers in, or the autotrophs, autotrophs, self feeders, to produce enough food to maintain themselves and more, and plus the others, which are the heterotrophs, the consumers, mm -hmm. talking about organisms. And so in principle, we could only have, we, we could have a perfectly balanced system in nature of life with one autotroph and one heterotroph. In other words, with one plant and one herbivore. And that would be sufficient to have uh, just uh, those two species to have uh, life on earth. 
But no, we don't. We have millions of plants, uh, plant species, and we have millions of, of animal species. <laughs> hmm? And uh, so we can see that diversity or variation is the name of the game. It's an expanding, expanding radiation, right? It's called expanding radiation, the branching effect, allegorically using the, the image of a tree, how the trunk branches into several large branches, which then become smaller branches, more. And eventually when you get down to the twigs, there's many, many more twigs in a tree than a single trunk. So uh, just in allegorically, we see the same effect over time with evolution branching out to variety, to the diversity of uh, species that we have. Now, let's uh, talk a little bit back to the core, which is the embryonic development. Phylogeny and ontogeny, right? Now, there has been a dictum, another dictum, of this uh, phylogeny recapitulates or ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Yes and no. Basically, Meyer shoots it down, as you know. Uh, we've been staying up with the reading, but this is what I'm talking about the, the dictum. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You know, we're into crunching, we're into synthesizing or making our language very succinct and meaningful. So here are three words that are loaded, right? So ontogeny is, again, lots of uh, Latin and Greek here. Geni, genus, genus, uh, genesis, origin, and onto, being, individual. So the origin of the individual, like each one of us from the time that our parents conceived us until we die. And then according to belief, we'll go into eternal life. We have an origin, but no end or no, no, uh, uh, no ending as such. That's a belief thing. But anyway, on earth, the origin of the individual, individual recapitulates it the redescribes or relives uh, recapitulation is to relive or to redescribe right something that has passed already phylogeny and now again jenny is origin phylo phylum the whole group in other words oops the origin of the whole group go back i messed it up <laughs> yes uh phylogeny the origin of the entire group, okay? And in fact, that's what we're doing in this course. We're doing the phylogenetics of the human, the human species, at least a human genus, homo, because we have at least half a dozen to a full dozen of non-sapiens, homos or hominins in, in a fossil record. And we are the only species of the genus homo that is living today but there's fossil record of other species, Homo, who have lived uh, before us thousands to millions of years ago. And we'll look at that. We'll get there uh, soon enough. Anyway, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. I can tell you, when I was a teenager studying biology in high school in Mexico City, this was a standard dictum. This was taught to me as uh, true science, but it's not true science, <laughs> okay? It's not true science. Because it turns out that the, uh, the origin of the individual does not really relive the origin of the entire group or the entire species. Mm -hmm. It does not in a strict sense, only in very general terms. And it does not because we don't change from species to species during our embryonic stage. So. This goes back to some diagrams that were done by this uh, scientist Herschel. Uh, this is a classical one, maybe 150 to 200 years ago, more or less. And here is the timeline of ontogeny and here's the timeline of phylogeny. So what do we have? 
again, looking just at the vertebrates because we have been looking mostly at vertebrates in, um, in today's lecture as exemplary of adaptedness, right? Uh, the salamander, the chicken, the pig, the monkey, and the human. So what is a salamander? A salamander is an amphibian. Chicken, fish, mammal, pig, monkey, human, mammals, all right? So we got an amphibian, a bird, did I say fish? A bird and uh, three mammals. When we start in ontogeny, what is the first stage of ontogeny? The first stage of ontogeny is called the zygote. The zygote. And the zygote is the first stage of embryonic development. And the zygote, which we'll see in luxury of detail next lecture in a couple of months, next uh, course on the beginning of human life. The zygote is a fertilized egg. I mentioned this many times before. It's not just to human, it, this is applies universally. If you look at universally, you look at a an honest <laughs> biology textbook, uh, you see plant fertilization, you'll see a zygote there. Inside the inside the flower, once the pollen fertilizes the egg or the ovum, we have a zygote, right? So, a, by definition, any egg, any ovum that is fertilized by a corresponding sperm from that same species, of course, becomes a zygote. And the zygote is diploid, has a full complement of chromosomes, chromosome pairs, as opposed to the gametes, the egg and the sperm by themselves. They're not diploid; they're haploid. They don't have a duplicate number of chromosomes, they have a single number of chromosomes. For the human, the single number of chromosomes, as we all know, is 23, from one to 22 autosomes, and then the sex chromosome, either X or Y, depending if we're male or female. So the single number is 23 for egg and sperm. When they fuse, they form the zygote, which is 23 plus 23 is 46, right? 46 or 23 pairs. So the zygote is the first individual cell that has a full complement of chromosomes, and it's diploid. And then from that point forward, as a single cell, from that point forward, within 24 hours normally, there will be the first cell division. Mm -hmm. That's mitosis. Until the end of our lives, organically speaking here on earth, where we develop trillions and trillions of cells. It's all mitosis, except in the reproductive organs that are producing precisely gametes through a double mitosis process that is called meiosis. Again, stick around for a couple of months and uh, we'll go through that in detail also. But my point is that the zygote is the first stage of embryonic development of any animal or plant that reproduces sexually. And all zygotes basically look alike. They are round. It's mostly, it's a, very similar to just the egg, the ovum, before fertilization. Uh, typically, they're microscopic, so we need a, a microscope to see them. But it's a little ball that is generally transparent. And then at the center of that ball will be another little ball that we call the nucleus, where the DNA is contained, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but Essentially, all cycles of whatever species, of millions of species, they all look alike. The size may vary a little bit. Like, for example, the uh, zygote of a human is about 10 microns across diameter, so we cannot see it with the naked eye. But the zygote of a cow is large enough that apparently can be seen by the naked eye like a little dot. <laughs> okay, I don't know if it's uh, 10 or 100 times larger than a than a human zygote, but it can be seen with a naked eye. Some very large mammals, it's just a question of size. Just like our cells in the body, the general body, are a little larger than the cells of a mouse. And that's what makes the mouse smaller, generally, is the size of the cells, generally, not always. Anyway, back to the zygote. First, single cell, as we all started, by fertilization or, or animals and plants that reproduce sexually, they all look alike across the board for millions of species, okay? However, then begins embryonic development. And so the second stage of embryonic development is called the morula. Morula, again, I'll get into 
more detail uh, about this uh, in the next course on the beginning of uh, human life. But the moral is the second stage and it's a cluster of cells. When you play this forward by cellular division from one, two, then four, each one of the two divides again and four, eight, 16, you get a geometric progression of duplication. At some point you end up with a cluster of cells it's like a little ball. And uh, it's still about the same size as the zygote, uh, but it's, uh, so each individual cell is smaller, right? And that's called the morula. They again, most morally look alike, look mostly alike. But here Herschel is trying to, is showing a little bit of difference between the different morally in size. Some of it is accurate, some is not too accurate. Again, the microscope he was using was not too accurate either. So he's trying to show a little differentiation. Some people say that he took artistic license in doing these diagrams, but he's showing a progression of development, right? From the, from the zygote all the way to the uh, juvenile that comes out, the, the, the young, either by hatching. Well, we know that salamanders, that amphibians, are egg-laying animals, so they hatch uh, from a little egg, just like fish, and birds also hatch, but then we get into the mammals, the pig, the monkey, and the human. They don't hatch because we have internal gestation and the placenta development and so forth. We are birth. We are birthed, we are born, right? So that would be like the final stage of the embryonic development from the original zygote. You can see that there is further differentiation. Let's take the third or the third stage is actually the blastocyst, which he didn't show here. Again, he didn't have access to that in his time, but had he shown the blastocyst or the blastula, they all look fairly alike for all these vertebrates with a little bit of difference between them, but the difference is more internal inside the ball of the blastocyst or the blastula. At some point, uh, we make a, a distinction here between the egg laying and the placental vertebrates, right? So these two uh, amphibians and birds are egg laying, whereas these other three are mammals. At this point, we would make a difference when the placenta does establish or not, when we get into uh, gastrulation, the gastrula, which globally would be like the fourth stage, the fourth stage. We have zygote, we have morula, we have gastrula, we have, uh, sorry, blastula, and then finally the gastrula, which is shown here, and gastrulation. Eventually, the embryo will have all the intergen organs in place in miniature, and it passes from embryo to fetus, more and more specific development. So, as we progress in ontogeny, the different species and the different groups are start looking less alike, less alike, okay? But there's still some common characteristics that we maintain. For example, the little tail, even in mammals, some mammals maintain their tail, other mammals reabsorb the tail, like the human, but we have a tail butt and it remains reabsorbed into the uh, pelvic region, which is the coccyx, the tailbone, all right? We don't know we have it until we fall on it, and then we find out painfully that it's there. And that's the remnants or a vestigial organ of the tail bud. All right, so the point here, you understand ontogeny is the embryonic development, progressive, from very very generalized cells to more specific uh, specialized cells that make up specialized tissues, organs, and systems when the actual organism is either hatched or, or, birth, or given birth, right? So his argument is that phylogeny, in other words, uh, amphibians and fish are more primitive than birds and mammals and reptiles, which he didn't put in here, okay? And so we see a general similarity of progress or recapitulation. Recapitulation meaning that if we take that dictum, 
in its uh, strict sense, it would mean that as mammals, as humans, first we are fish <laughs> when we are at the zygote level, then we are like, let's say amphibians at the moral level, then we are reptiles at the uh, blastocyst stage, and then we are birds at the gastrula stage, and finally we become mammals at the fetal stage of embryonic development. That's what this saying says in the strict sense. So it was an overreach, and it was our overreach of trying to prove evolution just by looking at the development of the individual. In the strict sense, it's false, it's not true, because like I say, we don't jump from one species to another during our embryonic development. No species does that. So that these zygotes, even though they all look alike, morphologically, at the level of the genetics, at the level of the genome, they are different species. So at the molecular level, they're not alike. There may be percentage homology, depending on how related they are to each other with common ancestors, remember the nodes, but strictly speaking, they're not, we don't go from species to species during our embryonic development. No organism does that, okay? So in the strict sense, the dictum ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny is false, only in the very broad sense of but not jumping from species to species, simply that there is a development, a embryonic development for more, from more generalized cells to more specific cells and tissues and organs. All right, so that's what this diagram then is strictly speaking is invalidated, cannot be used unless he's just referring to uh, actual embryonic development, which obviously goes from more generalized cells, a single cell to trillions of cells by the time we're born uh, which are by and large uh, specialized. Okay, also with regards to the best adaptation, but not the ideal adaptation. For example, you can use sea organisms, sea mammals and sea reptiles, like the sea turtle, right? I think this is a hawk's bill. Uh, sea turtles are very protected nowadays because we're coming fewer and fewer. They're uh, most of it from overhunting them. They are delicacies in parts of the world. And usually it's just the tail, the, the sad to kill a whole turtle just for the fin. And typically uh, the, the fins are what is used uh, for eating. Uh, the shell, of course, is not edible. The internal organs are not too edible and the head not too edible either. So killing a whole turtle just for eating the fins, like it's happening with sharks, is real bad news, right? That's kind of behavior we need to modify for sure, but there's a market for them. And so the, if there's a market, then there's a black market for them. Okay, they're protected, but uh, people, some people still hunt them illegally. And you can uh, find turtle soup and so forth if you look hard enough. All right. Anyway, the turtle is obviously a reptile. Therefore, it has lungs, no gills, which are not the best adaptation for living in the water. But sea turtles are totally sea turtles, unless we're coming to land for hatching, for dropping their eggs. Mm -hmm. And so it means that they periodically have to go to the surface to breathe. And when they go to the surface to breathe, they take in air that is a hazard that exposes them to predation because they're a little awkward at the surface. They're, they, as you can see, they're very well adapted to swimming around. Not, uh, they cannot outswim a shark, for example, okay? But at the surface, they're even more vulnerable because they're at the interface of two fluids, the liquid and the air, all right? And they're vulnerable when they come up for that breath every 20 minutes or two hours or whatever it is that they need to come up for air to refill their lungs and then plunge down again. Also, when turtles take air, uh, for a few minutes, they're actually vulnerable because they have too much air, kind of, and they cannot dive fast enough. It's a little awkward when they fill, fill their lungs fully uh, because they their positive buoyancy, they don't, they're floating 
all right? And that makes them extra vulnerable at the surface when they come up for that gulp of air. Mm -hmm. So they have to do it quickly and then start metabolizing, pushing that air through their tissues so that then they can dive uh, uh, and get away from the surface, which is a dangerous area, <laughs> believe it or not, precisely because of the interface. All right, so you can see that the turtle, the sea turtles are adapted, but it's not really the best adaptation to have lungs in the sea. Same argument for uh, marine mammals. They, all the marine mammals have to come up for air to the surface. They cannot stay on the water indefinitely. That includes whales, dolphins, dugongs, and the manatee, and what else? All of these uh, sea mammals that live marine, all right, but uh, have to go up to the surface for, uh, for air periodically. All right, uh, then what happens? Okay, shifting a little. This is just an image of variation. We're coming uh, close to the end here. Variation in species make up what we call communities because typically species are uh, in populations. They can be populations of a few individuals, like for example, bears. It could be just a pod of, uh, or the clan of bears with mama bear and papa bear and baby bears, uh, which would be just a few individuals for large territorial hunting. Or it could be a lot of individuals in a small, relatively small region of, um, of territory that forms that population, like for example, fungi of the same individuals of the same species. Many individual fungi make up a single population, right? Because remember population by definition is a single species. But when we put different populations of different species together, we form a community. And that's going to be populations of animals, populations of plants, and populations of fungi Another population which we don't see here, which is the population of bacteria, which are mostly underground, but also on the surface. They're rotting uh, carcasses that are decaying, et cetera, et cetera. So four major groups, and we're doing that, that simplified classification of organisms, plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria, right? They all have populations. And then when those populations come together, of uh, different species, they form the next layer, which we call communities, communities. And then we add the non-living factors, the abiotic factors to those communities, like the weather, the amount of uh, rainwater, the amount of uh, temperature, soil, sunlight, etc. Then we form ecosystems. So communities where we look at the whole picture, communities in their place, on nature, where they live on earth, then that forms an ecosystem. And that's what ecology studies. Ecology studies the ecosystem. So you can see that ecology is not just biology that is studying plants and animals. It's not just zoology that is studying the animals. It's not just botany that is studying the plants or mycology that is studying the, the fungi. It's all of them together. So ecology is an umbrella, it's a complex of many different um, other disciplines, right? Ecology is truly interdisciplinary. And it also includes, includes things like climatology and mineral, mineralogy and so forth uh, that are non-living systems. So ecology is truly an interdisciplinary field uh, that is complex and that is an emerging field. Well, it's fairly established by now but uh, it's one of these uh, uh, good systems to get into, good uh, careers to get into, because it's all about preserving the environment, right? All the current topics of climate change and all that, ecologists are the experts. All right, so I've been giving examples of land, but that this variety or adaptedness also occurs in uh, liquid environments. <clears throat> like the oceans, and then in the ocean, we find generally three layers, three layers from the surface to the bottom. Now, this is in the water column. This is what is known as the pelagic region, pelagic, 
which is the water column itself, all right? It's not the shoreline and it's not the, the actual very bottom of the ocean that is called the benthic region. This is, uh, let me put those three words there for, again for uh, the oceans. We have the shoreline is the littoral and then there is the uh, pelagic just for the spelling. We can look them up in more detail and then benthic. The littoral is a shoreline, uh, whether it's sandy or not, it could be rocky, it could be uh, mangroves, etc., vegetation, or, or it could be the uh, shoreline of a uh, of a river uh, estuary or or a uh, um, delta, which has also soil and sand and silt. Pelagic is the water column itself, and then the benthic region is the ocean bottom right, from the littoral down. The column itself, the pelagic region, is subdivided into three categories generally from the penetration of light. So uh, the shorter wavelength lights will be filtered out in the upper 200 meters more or less. And that's the sun, they just call it sunlight region here. And then the light starts uh, being filtered out. The, the, uh, the reds start filtering out on the infrared, uh, but the ultraviolet range penetrates deeper. That's why the bluish colors deeper. And that's the twilight zone until you get into oops, the midnight zone, which is dark. And that's where you have uh, animals that have adapted with uh, bioluminescence, for example, bioluminescence. They glow in the dark because it's all dark down there. Mm -hmm and that there's not much coloring. The typical color, the actual color of the animals down there is typically black or red. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whereas in the twilight zone, it's a transition, lots of browns and reds and blues. You find variety of color, but the greatest variety of color on the animal themselves is uh, in the sunlight region. And also the greatest variety of species, as you can see here, Right, not only fish, but also invertebrates like mollusks, like octopods and squids, and also jellyfish and so forth. Whereas as you go deeper, it's mostly fish or uh, mollusks that have adapted. And in the benthic region itself, in other words, attached to the bottom, you have salenterates, which are polyps, which are some anemones, anemone uh, type uh, uh, animals. And then also the algae, the seaweeds that grow from the bottom, sometimes through hundreds of feet to the very surface, like we have, for example, here off the coast in the Bermuda Triangle, right? Uh, it's um, it's uh, the bottom is uh, seaweed, the sargassum, that big patch of sargassum that it's coming our way, huge, that it's gonna hit the, the shore, well, maybe this week or, I don't know if it hit the shore already, but they were predicting there was going to ruin uh, uh, spring break <laughs> because a uh, huge patch of sargassum weed was coming down to the south, across to South Florida from the sargassum sea. Uh, I haven't kept up. I don't know if it's actually hit the shore or not, but uh, those weeds come from the very bottom of the ocean. They're brown, brown, uh, they're phyophytes, brown algae from the bottom all the way through the water column to the surface. And of course, at the surface, they get broken up by the action of the shore of the, uh, sorry, of the uh, wind, the uh, waves. And then they're pushed to the shore, which is generally in this direction because our prevailing winds on the shoreline is from the Southeast, meaning from the Caribbean. All right, so greater variety. You can see each individual is adapted enough to survive, not ideal, perfect, but adapted enough to survive. Obviously, a long beak of the sailfish is kind of hazard to moving around there, or the big fin tail that they have, the, the dorsal uh, fin. Mm -hmm. But this dorsal fin collapses when they're swimming around backwards, so that's more hydrodynamic. Mm -hmm. But some fish are more hydrodynamic than others. You can see, really, when you start looking in detail, they're not perfectly adapted, but they're adapted enough 
to survive in whatever environment they're at. So they're adapted enough to survive. Hmm? Okay, um, going forward a little faster. I also talked about all these different, uh, so now these are ad, ad, advantages and disadvantages, right? So I talked about the hollow bones, advantage, it makes it lighter. Disadvantage, it makes it more brittle and uh, subject to break. The fish necessarily has to have a hydrodynamic shape to be able to move through the water column and offer the least resistance. But by having a hydrodynamic shape, then there is a compromise on the size of the fins and so forth. And so uh, there is advantage and disadvantage to a hydrodynamic uh, body to be able to move through the water column. And there's resistance at the front end of the fish from the water column. Uh, we see the eye of fish and the eye of mammals is different because we both live in fluids, but the fish fluid is much thicker than the mammal fluid. Talk about terrestrial mammals. The terrestrial mammal fluid is the air, right? Which is much thinner, less density. So it offers less resistance to light and therefore to vision. Whereas because there is more filtering in the water column, then the lens of the eye for the fish has to be much larger than the lens of the eye of a mammal, which is more uh, concave and convex looking than in the fish is practically a circle. It's the maximum surface that you can get <laughs> on the uh, on a lens and then, so that offers what is known as fish eye vision, right? The fish eye vision, which can be imitated in a camera. It magnifies everything up front, but it has low depth of vision because in, in the water environment, you're gonna lose vision soon in, in depth. There's not much depth, you know, a few feet uh, in front is gonna get murky anyway, so it's no, no need to see very deeply in the ocean because one loses, uh, because of the particles that are suspended or solution in the, is suspended in the water column, then that is uh, diminishing the sight, if you will, uh, fairly soon in, in distance, fairly fast in distance. Whereas the air, as long as the air is clean, one can see literally for miles, right? However, to compensate for that, the fish have developed a big ear because uh, sound transmits through, uh, through the water column much easier, much faster than light. Uh, and so um, it's the ear actually covers the ear of the fish, goes from head to tail, and it's called the lateral line. It's the equivalent of our ear. And it basically goes through the whole fish laterally. You can see it here in the goldfish, for example. Uh, you can see it in a big, uh, I guess it's, I think this is a tarpon, it goes all the way through. Look at this, that's the lateral line there, very visible, okay? And that lateral line goes from head to tail, but at the head, he also goes around the different regions of the head, the eye, the mouth, etc., and the dorsal uh, aspect. These are little cells that are connected to the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And they detect movement on the, uh, on the uh, water column because the sound is going to be transmitted by wave, wave motion. And then that signal is picked up and sent to the brain. All right, so that's their equivalent of an ear, if you will, because it's a sound wave that moves through, uh, goes through the whole body. And our ear doesn't go from head to tail, right? Doesn't go to, from head to, to toe, <laughs> uh, but theirs do. So that's compensating for a narrow vision or a short vision range. They have a very long ear. Mm -hmm. So adapted to the environment. Now, these are specific adaptations that are at the level of the uh, dynamics of or the actual structure in detail, if you will, 
of the animal or plant or organism, like for example, leaves, this also happens in plants. The leaves generally are flat and face the sun because that's the maximum exposure of light. These are specific adaptations, all right? They're not general adaptations. The general adaptation, for example, of plants is, an, is a characteristic that is shared by all plants. For example, chlorophyll, right, chlorophyll. But you notice that specific adaptation of the leaf is different between deciduous trees and conifers because conifers have needles instead of leaves, which are round and thin, uh, which is very sharp contrast from uh, leaves in a deciduous tree. So those are specific adaptations that can have the greatest variety. Going forward, a bit more. All right, so at the end, we get into uh, just straight up evolution, but we can also look at convergent and parallel evolution. Convergent and par parallel evolution is, again, in the big picture, of areas that typically are geographical regions that are separated by large areas so that they don't communicate with each other. So we're talking about relatively large geographical areas that are isolated from each other by typically oceans. So there is in general no communication today between these different geographical regions. We normally call them continents, but they used to be together way back, remember Pangaea and the, the, the large supercontinent, which goes back to uh, about 250 million years ago. We certainly have lots of plants and animals living on earth back then with the, with the crust of the earth or the, uh, the, the land mass exposed outside of water, outside of the oceans was, um, was a supercontinent and then it broke up through plate tectonics and started moving north and south, et cetera. So eventually we get the seven continents that we have today, right? But of the seven, six are inhabited. In other words, exclude uh, the, uh, the southern, uh, the Antarctica, but the others are, are inhabited. Now, many plants and animals, but many of these plants and animals have common ancestors when it was a supercontinent. Mm -hmm. Talked about the camels, for example, the camelids that uh, are today in Asia and Africa, but uh, they also used to be in North America, way back. Mm -hmm. uh, and but they were hunted down, they were, were herbivores, they're fairly easy to hunt down by primitive uh, humans and they were wiped out, but there are fossil records of uh, camelids in the, here in, in North America. Anyway, uh, so we get either parallel or convergent evolution. Parallel evolution is when we have two large groups of animals that have a common ancestor, but develop independently and develop analogous uh, characteristics, analogous characteristics. So here is a comparison of animal pairs, as you can see, animal pairs, right? From Australia and other continents of the world. Australia compared to other countries of the world. Keeping in mind that in Australia, originally, there were no carnivores hunting down the herbivores. So it was a herbivore paradise, if you will. In other words, mammals that were all vegetation, they were, ate only vegetation. Okay? They didn't hunt each other. So for example, um, the, typically the top animal here is the Australian animal. So there's something called uh, a glider, short tail glider or sugar glider that lives in Australia. And then of course in uh, North America or uh, I don't know exactly where they are, but these flying squirrels. These squirrels that um, have developed a flap of uh, skin in between the forward legs and the hind legs, the forelegs and the hind legs. So it allows them to glide from tree to tree, actually. okay? I don't know exactly where they exist, but they exist outside of uh, Australia. So you see they have developed a parallel, by parallel evolution, they have uh, developed um, analogous structures that have the same function. 
Uh, this uh, is a small marsupial mouse, and this is a uh, regular house mouse, all the many different mouses that we have, um, mice, <laughs> mouses, mice that we have in North America, in Africa, in uh, all the other continents, Asia and, um, and Europe. There is a marsupial mole. There's a, there's a mole in Australia. There's a mole in the other continents of the world independent, they have developed independently, the same adaptation, the same basic body shape, all right? Independently of each other from the common ancestor. There is a Tasmanian wolf, obviously in the island of Tasmania, and there is the regular wolf prowling through North America, Europe, and Asia. Mm -hmm. There is a wombat in Australia, and there is a marmot and groundhog and woodchuck that have a similar structure to the wombat in North America, right? Going beyond to the Southern Hemisphere continent of uh, Africa, South America, India, etc. There is a uh, numbat, numbat or uh, anteater in Australia or Tasmania or New Zealand, somewhere down there. And there is certainly the African anteater, which again feeds on ants, but totally independent evolution. Uh, this is known as parallel evolution and super adaptive, very similar, well, somewhat similar, you have to use a little imagination, but the long snout is the most similar characteristic. And then the long, the very long uh, tongue, for catching that uh, those uh, uh, termites. They're mostly termites, ants, but termite eaters. So technically speaking, they're termites. Oh, they also have large claws to break apart the termite uh, mount, okay? And get into the termites. And finally, another one, this is known as a tiger cat or a native cat from uh, Australia. And this is a real, well, there are many wild cats, right? Of the Felix family or the Nopartus family. Mm -hmm. Tigers, lions, uh, cheetahs, etc. But uh, this one is a spotted type of uh, cheetah compared to this spotted uh, for camouflage. But the common characteristic of all these marsupials in contrast to the placentals is that the marsupials, their babies, their embryos don't have a placenta. So all the ones that live in Australia, all the mammals that live in Australia, uh, Tasmania and New Zealand that are native are, placenta, are marsupials, right? So they have to be born prematurely and crawl into the pouch. So all of these animals, all of these mammals have pouches regardless of their specific lifestyle, which you can see is very varied from the from their shape. Whereas the placentals, they all gestate their young, okay? So you can see a major difference, and yet they have developed common characteristics, which is known as parallel evolution. Convergent evolution is a little different, Oh yeah, so here let's talk about placenta, marsupial, I'll talk about this already. Here's another example in uh, birds. We have the hummingbird in North America and we have the honey creeper in Hawaii, the Hawaiian islands. Uh, and the biggest uh, common characteristic here is the long beak, which is super adapted for um, sucking honey from or nectar from the flowers, from the local flowers, in contrast, for example, of a beak of a parrot or a parakeet or a wakamaya or any of these that crunch nuts, which is a very hard beak that can uh, break a nut and can also break a finger if you're not careful <laughs> and getting close to the, uh, to the parrots, all right? So don't get too close to a parrot because they may be playing, but in playing, they may break your finger with that hard uh, 
beak. Now, the beak of a hummingbird or honey creeper is not going to break a nut and it's not going to break a finger because they're super adapted for suckling or sucking uh, uh, nectar from flowers. Another case uh, from Africa and uh, North America is the African porcupine and the North American porcupine. Again, they have a common ancestor, but way back because the, uh, these two continents have been separated from each other for millions of years, Africa and North America, okay? They're not even in the same hemisphere any longer. Well, they take it back. Africa, half of Africa, the, the biggest part of Africa on the top is uh, technically is in the Northern hemisphere. But anyway, they have adapted to uh, similar environments, if you will, with similar adaptations. So it's another example of uh, parallel evolution. Another one that is different, this one is now convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. It's between pine trees, the true pine, and what is known as Australian pine. I mentioned this Australian pine because we have it here in South Florida and also in the Caribbean, and it's super invasive. And it does come from Australia, but it's not a real pine. So that's why I put it in quotations. It's not a real pine. It's not a real conifer. For example, true pines, real pines have cones instead of leaves and have, sorry, cones instead of flowers and have leaves instead of, uh, I have needles instead of leaves, all right? So again, true conifers have cones instead of flowers and have needles instead of leaves. Now let's look at the Australian pine. The Australian pine looks like a pine tree because it has that conical shape, has a conical shape. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's uh, a conifer is not a reference to looking like a cone, but rather that they produce co cones. Mm -hmm. They produce cones. Anyway, look at the, the branch and the needles in quotation, the needles of a of an Australian pine, they're not real needles. If we magnify what seems to be a needle, right? If we magnify it, we actually see that they're segmented. They're segmented and you can barely see that here. I lose resolution. Oh, didn't. All right, so the Australian pine, if you take a single needle from an Australian pine and you see them all over the place, uh, they're really segmented. It's got little segments. Okay, so that's not a real needle. Because a real needle from a true pine, from a true conifer, is, is uh, <clears throat> as long as it's a single structure. It's a single structure. Okay, from the base to the tip. But not for the Australian pine. The Australian pine needle is segmented because actually what we have in each one of these segments is a series of leaves, little tiny leaflets that you can see here in this magnification. These are little leaflets. They're anywhere from seven to 11, <laughs> no reference to the store, just a coincidence, but they're anywhere from seven to 11 of these little leaflets collapsed against the twig, what is really the twig. So inside the, um, Let's say the inner part of the twig of the uh, the inner part of the needle of an Australian pine is actually a twig. It's a long twig that has all these little leaflets in segments uh, collapsed against it, right? And this is what they look like magnified. So I've mentioned the word collapse several times. So what does that mean that the leaf, the actual leaflet is tight against the mm, twig? It's tight against the twig to avoid desiccation, to avoid dehydration. And so you can also tell, you know that the underside of leaves have uh, little things called uh, stomata. There are little holes on the underside of leaves, right? 
So this is one stomatum, several stomata, two or more stomata. They are on the underside of the leaf. They are on the underside of the leaf, generally. And they're used for breathing. <laughs> There's an actual photograph. It's a micrograph, microphotograph, microscopic photograph, colorized. So one can see it. Uh -huh. These are the stomata which are open. Sometimes they're closed. They close at night to avoid desiccation, to avoid dehydration, and they open during the day. So why does the leaf need holes in it for the atmosphere to get through, for air to get through? Because the leaf needs to breathe. Wow, a leaf needs to breathe? Yes, a leaf needs to breathe because what does the leaf do functionally? Photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis. Well, photosynthesis starts with water and carbon dioxide. Water comes in a liquid form from the roots, but carbon dioxide comes in a gas form from the atmosphere, which means that that gas form from the atmosphere needs to get inside the leaf where photosynthesis actually occurs. In other words, the stomata are there functionally to allow atmosphere to get into the inside of the leaf, into the, into the mesophyll, the thickness, the middle part of the leaf. The middle of the leaf, the mesophyll, that's where the photosynthetic pigments are. And therefore, air from the atmosphere and specifically the CO2 of the air needs to get in there, okay? And it comes in through the somata. But at the same time that that air comes through, the leaf itself, which is alive and it's respiring, it's undergoing cellular respiration, the leaf itself has water vapor that it's trying to conserve so it doesn't dehydrate totally. And so the stomata open and close according to the amount of air, uh, the amount of um, uh, water vapor that the plant is producing and trying to hold to it onto itself so that it doesn't dehydrate, it doesn't dry, so that the leaf doesn't dry out, desiccate. So this collapsing of the leaves and it's now you can see, you can tell just from the structure that the part that is exposed to the outside of the leaflet is the, is the upper part of the leaf. And the inside of the leaf is facing inside, it's facing the twig. And it is uh, collapsed to prevent dehydration as much as possible. So this, there will be stomata on the inside and so forth. But what little air gets in through here, and imagine what little air can get in through there, but some air does get it through. And what CO2 component of that air? Hmm? Again, I mentioned, I think it's 0 0.04, but I just can't remember all these things, all these numbers, in my little brain. Uh, CO2 component of atmosphere or percentage. Oh, COS? No, I got it wrong. <laughs> CO2. 0.4, percent percent, okay? So it's 1% or it would be 4%, 0.4%, 0 0.04%. Okay, this is in the centesimal region, centesimal. That's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's the amount of CO2 that plants need to live and to thrive as we see all of the vegetation around us on a daily basis. So imagine what little amount of CO2 gets in there is enough, necessary, sufficient to keep the Australian pine alive in Australia where it's native. Mm -hmm. Because it's an extreme adaptation to desiccation, to dehydration. 
Now, before I show you a map of Australia, another adaptation is the actual flower, which is not a cone. It looks like a cone. They say this, oh, professor, why do you say that's not a cone? That's a cone. Look at that. That's a cone. That looks like a cone. You know, it looks like a cone. It walks like a cone. It quacks like a cone. Then it's a quacking cone. It's not a duck. <laughs> this one looks like a cone, but it's not a cone. It is a hard, woody flower hmm? that has a very similar structure by convergent evolution to a pine cone, to a true real cone. But it's not a cone because, well, it's a flower. <laughs> in other words, here is the flower in bloom. You can see it's reddish, fleshy. And here is the cone when it's green. And again, a little more fleshy. And here are the seeds of a dry cone. And the seeds are actually the same adaptation as a pine tree. They are wind driven, so they are winged seeds. They are winged seeds, they have wings, all right? So this is the actual seed is here and the wing is a patch, of course. And they just fly around like the pine tree seeds do the same adaptation, identical in that same functionally to move those seeds through the environment, right? For uh, seeding. Uh, other uh, trees to grow there. Go back here. And so this is an extreme example, this Australian pine oy, of a tree that is not a pine at all. It's deciduous, but looks very much like a conifer by convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so the thing about Australia, because Australia is, yeah, well, it's part of Oceania, but I want to see, oh, here, the geo photo. This collapsed this. Yeah, Australia is such a large con uh, island that is actually considered a continent, all right, surrounded mostly by the Pacific Ocean. And, but the, so the, Perimeter of Australia is uh, more green, as you can see here, but the center is a huge desert. The center is a huge desert, okay? And therefore, there, trying to get the cloud cover away a little bit. It's very, very extremely dry, desertic, which is again, typical of islands. Uh, of course, this is a, super mega island, which is considered a, a continent, but the center is very dry. So you can see that most of the land mass in Australia is actually very, very dry. All right, so a big thing down there uh, is making wells to get water so that it's livable and so forth, but it's mostly on the edge of the continent that is inhabited and where most animals and plants live. But the Australian pine is kind of a pioneer species that has adapted to live on the fringe and into the desertic region by these extreme adaptations of uh, convergent evolution. Not a real pine tree, a deciduous tree. Finally, just uh, the last argument uh, in favor of adaptedness. And this is a point that is made strongly by evolutionary, uh, evolutionarians today in contrast to the pseudoscience of, of um, the uh, <clears throat> irreducible complexity that we get from fundamentalists and, and um, some religious people that don't accept evolution, that say only creation, typically they interpret the Bible literally, which they take exception to, I've spoken about that. But basically they say uh, there are some structures that are so complex that they cannot be reduced to primitive structures and they typically point at the eye of the human is such a complex structure It's fascinating how the eye works functionally and how well adapted the eye is for depth of vision for three dimensional and etc we can see very up close typically we can focus even closer than uh, the the end of our arm if we stretch out our arms for a moment and we look at our fingers 
inside, right? We look at the inside of our fingers. We can so stretch out your arm for a moment and look at your um, at your um, what is that called? Come on, fingerprint. Now move your hand forward slowly. You can see that the arm needs a hinge in it in order to bend and reach the mouth, right? Because it's a good thing for the hand to reach the mouth. All right, and so we can get so close, maybe within probably about a foot, maybe a little closer than a foot. Uh, we can actually see our fingerprint, very tiny. We can see our fingerprints. I can see the little ridges of my fingerprint of the fingers, all right? That's how close we can see. Now, get rid of that hand and look out into the horizon, out the window somewhere. We can see for miles. I don't know exactly what the map, but as long as the air is clean, we can see for miles way out there, little tiny dots. We can even see stars in the sky, right? Which are actual planets. Uh, we can sort of see the moon, which is thousands of miles away from us. We can see stars, which are actually either whole galaxies or planets. We can see them, little dots <laughs> with the same eye. Hmm? Okay, so hmm, uh, very complex structure. And the fundamentalist uh, creationists tell us, okay, well, that's an irreducible complexity. Uh-uh, not so, because the eye has actually developed in evolution. The eye, sorry, the eye has developed in many different species, many different species that are only distantly related over time, many times. For example, again, the eye of mammals, the eyes of Insects, like a fly. Ours is what we call a simple eye or just one pair of eyes. But um, arthropods, they have are known as complex eyes. Uh, each one of these is a, an actual little tiny eye and it gives a, a fragmented view. It's like a, like a puzzle or like a um, compound. They're called compound eyes. So each one is a little fragment, it's a composite, right? It's like a mosaic, mosaic is what I was looking for. So it gives a mosaic image and the fly has to interpret that mosaic, right? As a whole image. But these are compound eyes, not simple eyes. So it's a analogous structure. It has the same function, but very different origin as a specific structure because this is not general structure, this is specific structure. General structure is just the shape of the body, for example, all right? And so a mammal and an arthropod, very uh, distantly related, and yet they have developed this structure that we call the eye to see with light, shapes or figures. Take a planaria, for example, which is a flat worm, again, very distantly related from the arthropods or the mammals. And they have simple little eyelids, simple eyelets, eyelets. And all that they detect is just difference between light and shadow, light and darkness. So they can move toward the light where they want to, or they can move into the shade when they want to. All right. So imagine they're just little eyelets. All right. Super simple, not as complex as the fly eye or the human eye at all but they are eyes by convergent evolution, all right? Uh, and in mollusks, this is another one that is not a flat worm, is not an insect, is not a mammal, it's not even a vertebrate, it's an invertebrate, and it is a clam, uh, which is a mollusk. Hmm? They have developed simple eyes, but multiple, million, dozens, in each rim, the upper rim and the lower rim of the clam, whatever is upper and lower on a clam, but on the two rims of the shell, the clam and, and uh, shell fish, we don't shell fish, they're not fish, but uh, shell animal mollusks, bivalves, they have all these little eyes along the edge. And again, it detects basically light and dark and maybe possibly some shape of uh, another creature coming toward them. So they can flee away, like for example, an octopus coming over to eat them, right? And they can scavenge away and try to hide from the octopus that is trying to eat them. So we can see that the eye has developed many different times independently in evolution from 
very distant, very distant common ancestors, okay? Over millions of years. And so this is an argument that is very strongly against uh, this irreducible complexity of the creationist, saying that God essentially created individual species as we see them today, and there has been no evolution from one species into another. Okay, folks, all about adaptiveness. So really, Meyer is looking at it functionally, right? That the structure of the thing is according to the function of the thing and not vice versa. In other words, form follows function and not the other way around. Thank you very much. Anything that I've uh, not covered, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, thanks again. And again, summaries uh, for those who are doing them are due by Wednesday midnight. And we will gather again next Saturday, God willing. Questions or comments from anyone? Thank you, Father Geoffrey. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too. And uh, we'll catch up again next week, God willing. Okay. So stop recording. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye.